America's symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Welcome everyone to the debut episode of That Was Extreme, right here exclusively on ad-free shows. I'm Josh Chernoff, and I have the honor of hosting a look back at Extreme Championship Wrestling with two ECW originals. First, he's the leader of the BWO and my co-host on the hit podcast, Mind of the Meanie, the Blue Meanie is here. Meanie, how's it going, man? Hey, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to Ad Free Shows for having us. And uh, I'm, thankful, I'm thankful that I'm here with uh, my brother in Extreme, Joel Gertner. So uh, this, I couldn't be more excited. And he is a man who needs no introduction, yet is famous for providing himself with one. The quintessential stud muffin and host of the 69-minute Eargasm podcast, Joel, you know what, Joel? I feel like you should probably do this yourself. So I'll give myself an introduction anyway. It is I, the lyrical miracle, the sexual, intellectual, the cunning linguist, and the quintessential stud muffin, Joel I asked the guy who owns the tattoo parlor and doubles as a pimp if he had any chicks with ink. He said, sorry, only tat-free hoes. He said, I can't wait to hear you and Meanie, though, on That Was Extreme, now that you're working with ad-free shows. Gertner. Wow. Well, thank you very much. There was no better way to start this show than that. Uh, before we get started on why we're here, which is to talk, of course, about Barely Legal, ECW's first pay-per-view, April 13th, 1997. Per first, I just want to know, how are you guys doing? Doing great, man. Uh, excited to be here uh, with everything going on in the apocalypse. Uh, happy that we have this avenue to uh, talk about the good old days with ECW. And thank you again to Ad Free Shows and uh, the Podfather, Conrad Thompson, for allowing this to happen. Joel, how are you? Good, man. Great. Can't complain. The night before, barely legal, which of course is what we're talking about. The night before, uh, there was a, 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 a banquet to honor Terry Funk. Uh, who would go on to main event, Barely Legal. Uh, were both of you, Meanie, I know you were there. Were both of you at this banquet? I was I not. Won. Okay, oh, so Joel was not um, because of the heat that he has with Terry Funk, and we all know about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, me saying that uh, he was only on TV in the black and white days. And oh, had my. Just put white color. No, we, you know, we were, um, you know, I'm sure you've heard of more human than human. Uh, the Dudleys at the time were deemed to be more heel than heel. And I think even though there were probably some heels there, uh, we were all told that our presence would not be required. That's interesting. Manny, you were there. Um, yeah. I know you have a fun story from that night. Yeah, I, I, I was there. And uh, it, was, it was a great night. Um, uh, my uh, moment was... Uh, and I still kick myself for this. Uh, Joey Styles comes up to me as uh, I'm sitting there for the banquet. He goes, hey, uh, Meanie, you want to say something for Terry Funk? And I go, me? <laughs> me? Uh, who am I to say something about Terry Funk? And plus, what can I say about Terry Funk that hasn't already been said? Sure. So I say, let me ponder it. You know, let me think. Because uh, I was really taken aback that they considered me to, to speak about Terry Funk. <laughs> So uh, the BWO goes up, me, Stevie, and Nova go up to, uh, you know, uh, say something about Terry Funk. Well, well it was going to be, I, as far as I knew, it was just going to be Stevie. And we were just going to be uh, like, uh, you know, uh, the backup singers. You know, it was going to be uh, Destiny's Child or whatever. Uh, <laughs> so uh, as, as Stevie's saying the speech, I was like, oh, I thought of something, right? So uh, CV says this thing, gets a round of applause, and as he's walking away, I uh, I go to uh, I go back to the I. It's like, hold on, I gotta say something. I go to the mic to start talking, 
And the guys who I didn't smart up that I was going to talk, start heading to the back. So it kind of looks like I went into business for myself during the Terry Funk roast. <laughs> I go, Oh, well, I got something to say. And then they're like, Oh, oh, oh Meanie's talking and they run back. So, and uh, I, I basically just said, you know, what I said now, what can I say about Terry Funk that hasn't been said? Sure. And uh, I thanked him for everything he's done in the business and, uh, you know, uh, give him a big old hug right there uh, at the banquet, because if it wasn't for ECW, I mean, if it wasn't for Terry Funk, it might not be an ECW. Uh, he gave ECW a lot of credibility in a time when uh, most people would do an indie and they're just getting in, they're in there to get their paycheck and leave. Mm -hmm. Terry was there not only to make a living, but make sure that the boys got over, uh, that the talent got over, so everybody could make a living. Uh, Terry Funk, hands down, uh, one of the big people responsible for ECW being able to make it to pay-per-view. Um, the pay-per-view was barely legal. It came to us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the ECW arena, no better place in the world for the first ECW pay-per-view to have taken place. It was April 13th, 1997. Uh, ECW earned 66,000 in ticket sales from an attendance of 1,170, uh, which was pretty much a jam-packed building there. Uh, yeah. Although Meltzer claimed it was 1,250, so I mean, either way. Uh, so perhaps he's counting non-paid as well. We're not sure about that. Either way, it was a sellout. Um, Meltzer said the show also set a company merchandise record doing just under $20 per head. Uh, Meanie, I know you have uh, mentioned before that the BWO shirts were the highest, at a time, highest selling ECW t-shirt there was. Uh, how many of those do you think you sold that night? <laughs> well, uh, when, like, you work for every company, uh, for any company, uh, the good thing is to make friends with everybody from production to, you know, from the top of the company down to the people who tear the tickets. And uh, I was friends with the, uh, the merchandise folks. And I was told on average, any night they were selling roughly 200 pwo shirt tonight wow so uh how many they sold that night i'm not quite sure but uh i was very flattered to see that and that's a beautiful thing about the bwo shirt it kind of stands out where most wrestling shirts are you know black you know you see the blue shirts in the crowd so that, that was pretty cool uh definitely there was a uh, definitely a packed house there uh i know melter likes to uh split hairs between paid and not paid but well, if I go to class and they take attendance, that still means I was there. It doesn't mean, you know, whatever. So, yeah, there was, uh, what was the figure? 1,200? Uh, uh, I don't know how many were legally in there. Uh, yeah, we, so, I, so 1,170 is what's been reported. Meltzer had, had uh, reported in the Observer shortly after the event that it was 1,250. So, yeah. again, I mean, that's really split. I mean, that's a difference of 100 people. Um, and... You know, like you said, who was there legally? Who who uh, snuck in? We don't really know. Um, but uh, I do want to talk about the pay per view uh, buy rate. You know, nowadays everyone's always talking about ratings; it's a big thing. But the buy rate was a point two six, which is the equivalent of approximately uh, approximately one hundred and four thousand buys. So Meltzer would say, when it was over, the show had to be considered a major success aesthetically for ECW. It was far from perfect, and the flaws many talk about with the promotion were more than evident. But when it was over, the strong points overwhelmed the weak points. It would also claim that the estimated total company revenue of two hundred and ten thousand, uh, which with a break-even point of uh, three fifty to four hundred, uh, was due to the limited number of homes available because of so many major systems refusing to carry the show. Uh, I said it would be a money loser as uh, for the show itself, but ECW had to guarantee request a certain number of buys to get them to carry the show. So I'm not sure exactly how that worked out, um, but I do want to put in perspective, Barely Legal did 0.26. That same month, WWF had In Your House 14, uh, Revenge of the Taker. That did a 0.5, uh, and that, head, that was headlined by The Undertaker defending the WWF title against Mankind, and Bret Hart versus Stone Cold in a number one contenders match. So, I mean, that was pretty much the best WWF had to offer 
at the time. Uh, WCW had Spring Stampede, which did a 0.58 that month, uh, headlined by DDP versus Randy Savage. Uh, so I would call that a huge success. If I'm looking at the numbers that they're drawing on pay-per-view in 97 versus what you're drawing that same month, how much talk was there backstage about the buy rate uh, or the tickets sold? Joel, we'll start with you. Um, not as much as you might think. Um, some among people who were interested in that kind of thing, but, um, but it, it's not like we would have the numbers posted up, uh, next to the lineup on a given night, like, you know, three day <laughs> last incident or whatever. Uh, you know, if you knew, knew, and if you didn't know, you didn't necessarily care to know. Right. Um, I think a lot of us maybe were wondering if there were going to be pay-per-view bonuses because we had all, we had always heard that the WWF business model was that once all the money comes in from the cable company for a pay-per-view to Vince, they go ahead and they invest it for six months in a CD. And once they've gotten some interest on it after the six months, they dispense pay-per-view bonuses out to the boys. And I think we were curious as to whether that would be the case for us as well or not. But you could probably count the number of people talking about the buy rate itself, the 0.26, maybe on a couple of hands. Um, but those who knew, um, knew that it was indeed a big deal that aside from the one or 2,000 people who were in the room paying for their ticket and buying $20 worth of merch, it was a much bigger deal that around the country, 100,000 other people were willing to pay um, what back then was quite a decent amount of money for an ECW show. What do you think? Do you think the invasion um, helped with those sales or people saying, you know what, I think I'm going to check it out. Or do you think if you were already into ECW, you were already going to buy it, maybe your minds weren't going to be changed? I think the, uh, the buy rate was a, a perfect storm of things. Uh, you know, if you, if, you know, if you wanted to watch ECW, you either had to watch it in Philly, uh, you had to catch it on a random UHF channel at like 2 AM across the country. When I was training with Al Snow in Lima, Ohio, I saw an ECW show on some random UHF channel in middle of Ohio, at like three in the morning. I was like, Oh my God. But, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, invasion show definitely helped. Uh, they, there was an invasion show and I think there was a subsequent, another appearance they did in, uh, Massachusetts, I believe. And, uh, you know, uh, before they, they getting back to the, uh, the buy rates and stuff like that, uh, Joel, uh, triggered a memory to where we had a show in, uh, Blackwood, New Jersey at the Blackwood CYO and Paul called like a pre-show meeting uh, about potentially doing the pay-per-view and stuff like that. And he broke it down to what Joel said, you know, uh, just so we didn't think there's any chicanery, you know, as far as pay-per-view bon bonuses go, he explained that, you know, how, uh, you know, the money would come in, they would invest it, and then we'd get a, a pay-per-view bonus and stuff like that. But uh, getting back to the, uh, the exposure, uh, I, I definitely think a, being a diehard ECW fan, uh, somebody who either watched it in Philly or somebody who was clamoring to watch it through tape trading uh, and, or people who caught it at like 3 o'clock in the morning, they all had a set time where they could watch it live as it happened for the first time ever. <laughs> you know, it, it, this was like a luxury to a lot of people who are used to just watching it through tape trading or a third generation copy of a VHS or something like that or you know, God rest his soul. Bob Ryder was always putting over uh, ECW on the, the on the chat rooms on the internet. I, we had a huge social media, all well, pre-social media, internet footprint. Thanks to the folks like Bob Ryder and stuff like that, who also helped spread the word. Uh, so there's many factors into, you know, what went into people, you know, wanting to buy our pay-per-view. And considering that number compared to all these multi-million dollar companies, I think we uh, did quite well. Um, Wholeheartedly, I agree with what Beanie said as far as it being, a, you want to call it a loss leader or a write-off, or you want to call it breaking you know, a few eggs to make an omelet. But it's super important, even at a loss, to just get that platform of pay-per-view up and running um, because you know, at, at the end of the day, 
like Meany said, you know, people in this market are watching it at 3 a.m. People in this market are watching it on public access. People in this market don't have it. They're only getting it through tape traders. And people wind up on stuff like Prodigy or AOL or CompuServe in the brand new, you know, frontier of the internet in 97. People wind up talking about ECW episodes the way they're talking about comic book issues because yeah. they're not exposed to it and seeing it at the same time, right? So ECW episode 183, people are talking about it like it's X-Men issue 183. They're all reading it at their leisure whenever they do, and then they're getting together after the fact to discuss. When you have Barely Legal on pay-per-view, the entire nation is watching it live at the same time. So I think, like Meany said, it was very important for us to have that in front of us. Um, the pay-per-view paydays are just going to ask it in here. <laughs> did, did, that, did that happen? Uh, we, we got something. Okay. Um, I, I can't speak for Joel. And uh, like a lot of people in the business, uh, talking money is like bad juju to me. Yeah. But uh, I will say this, uh, you know, especially when, you know, came to the BWO shirts, people go, oh, you must have made a million dollars with the BWO shirts. And it's just like, you know, every couple months I would get a check. And like we, me and Stevie did the math and we're like, oh, that's like 10 cents a gross. <laughs> so, uh, but hey. You know, uh, when it came to uh, Barely Legal, a couple months down the line, we got a check. Uh, and the reason I what, bring it up is because oh, yeah, know, yeah. Paul Heyman, is, is fans have a tendency to just buy into the narrative that Paul Heyman never paid anyone, owes everybody money, all that, you know. So that's why I always, when there's an opportunity, meaning like we know this from my oh, yeah. when we do the show, we I, I do like to be able to point out that that's not necessarily across the board true at all times. Um, Paul, Paul, Paul Heyman owes me nothing. Uh, cause you know, I was, I was, in, when I got, went to, when I went to ECW, I was a year and a half into the business and, uh, there's plenty of t times where he could have just let me go for man, some of the mistakes I made, you know, but he, uh, stuck with me. Uh, he still continued to give me an opportunity. I was in the opening of the TV show week in and week out. So what do you talk, when you talk about, you know, paying, you could talk about a dollar amount or you could talk about equity. Mm -hmm. He gave me equi equity in the company where I was in the opening of the show. I was in the, uh, I was in the uh, Pulp Fiction, you know, montages at the end of the show. He always made sure there was uh, a, a segment for me to be involved. And if it wasn't for him giving me a segment to be involved, Nobody would know who I am. I wouldn't be doing this special with you guys right now. And, uh, you know, you know, who knows if I ever would have made it to WWE down the line. So, uh, when it comes to, I never made a million dollars in this business, but I got paid royally in experience and friendship, like you know, the one I have today. So Paul, ha Paul Heyman owes me nothing. Tell us a little bit about the start and stop of this pay-per-view because it was supposed to happen a decent amount of time before it actually did. Um, and of course, you know, longtime ECW fans remember the mass transit incident. Um, can you tell us, Joel, if you can tell us a little bit about how that came to uh, affect the pay-per-view? There were a few things that affected the pay-per-view. Uh, everything from the mass transit incident, which was... Uh, uh, a moment in one of our matches that was exceedingly violent uh, with an untrained professional wrestler who in, involved himself in in our family and our roster and our backstage and kind of misrepresented himself. And there was everything from him, you know, wanting to work with New Jack and get over in the worst possible way and open himself up to, to all sorts of, you know, the, the very most extreme of ECW. Uh, to stuff like us being confused with shoot fighting because there was a company that was challenging UFC at the time that was called EFC, Extreme Fighting Championships. So Extreme Championship Wrestling would get confused with Extreme Fighting Championships at a time when MMA was going through a very dark period when it came to exposure because there was a lot of political wrangling about trying to get it banned because it was seen at the time in the mid-90s as human cockfighting, so by some. So uh, yeah, I mean, th there were a lot of fits and starts uh, as to um, 
you know, we could have probably been on pay-per-view uh, closer to 96, maybe even 95 when wrestling really first started heating up, you know, in uh, September of 95, you've got Nitro. And then I think the bash at the beach where the NWO started was the summer of 96. There was a lot of wrestling and uh, money in wrestling before the spring of 97. And I'm sure the thought was to get us on pay-per-view a good year and a half or so before we actually were. But uh, like you say, for one reason or another, uh, it just kind of, you know, it wasn't able to get off on, on the ground and, and run. Do you think that that was a, a blessing in disguise? Do you think that maybe you, you wouldn't have been ready as a roster, as a company, had this happened in 96 or uh, especially in 95? I think we were, I mean, the, the delay of let's call it a year and a half made us more ready in one sense because it was so long overdue and we felt entitled and we were chomping at the bit. Sure. So in that respect, I guess, yes, there are some people, if you ask them what their favorite era of ECW was, and it was, you know, the company was only around for about nine years. So it's weird that there are different errors and a lot of people break it down by their favorite year or whatnot. But a lot of people will say creatively, we were really firing on all cylinders closer to 95, maybe 96 like I said before, which happened to coincide with stuff like the start of Nitro, the start of the NWO. So, um, you know, were we the most ready in early to mid-97? Uh, again, in one or two respects, maybe yes. And looked at a few other ways, maybe we really would have been just as ready uh, a year or so earlier. Um, I look at those eras as kind of like you have your pre-pay-per-view ECW, you have your pay-per-view ECW, and then you have your uh, TNN ECW. And I think if I had to pick, you know, for me, it really was tail end of the pre-pay-per-view and then into the pay-per-view. That was in my fandom. Um, but I do, I, I understand what you're saying. And that's part of what got to that pay-per-view point was the creativity because especially in a time, it's well-documented uh, on plenty of shows here on ad-free shows Dot com that uh, 95 wasn't a great year for the WWF. Uh, 94, 95, like that time period really was not maybe it's, it's uh, the, the peak of its creativity. Um, obviously, WCW was revving up in a 96 with the NWO. That's where the whole wrestling business began to explode. Um, Meany, what, with, what do you think, uh, just for you personally even, we'll say, do you think you as a performer and, and your peers would have been ready in 95 or in 96 to go on pay-per-view? Uh, ironically enough, uh, I, I think there was a meeting. Uh, I talked about the one meeting at the, the CYO. That's when the pay-per-view had already been announced and he was break, you know, preparing us for the pay structure and stuff like that. But then when there was the initial talks that there was going to be a pay-per-view uh there was a, a meeting like a post-show meeting at the dog track the wonderland uh dog track in uh, massachusetts where he started talking about the possibility of us having a pay-per-view and then it was that incident at that same dog track with mass transit that you know our our pay-per-view was kind of derailed uh i always say this uh i've said this a few times on mine the Domini. But the ironic whole thing, the whole ir irony about mass transit was every New England show, Boston area show, uh, Killer Kowalski would come to those shows and he would bring his students. You know, uh, there was one time a young China, uh, you know, his was his student there, you know, watching the pre-show workouts. So this this kid, uh, Mass Transit, shows up and says he's a student of Killer Kowalski and he trained with Killer Kowalski. This is the one show Killer didn't show up at. And no, if Killer, no reason to believe that he's lying though, because this happened all the time. Right, right. Oh yeah, Killer would show up with the students and stuff like that. So the one time Killer Kowalski doesn't show up, this kid shows up and goes, "Hey, I was trained by Killer Kowalski. If Killer Kowalski had been there, he could have said, oh, this is bullshit,' you know and you no, know, things could have been averted, but, um, you know, getting back to the pay-per-view, uh, were we ready? Um, I think in a sense we were as ready as we never were. 
uh, <laughs> you know, a handful of us did the uh, ECW evasion angle and roll. Uh, but the company as a whole, uh, we were just, uh, we, we, we were running on all cylinders in 96. That, to me, that was our, our hottest year uh, from a storyline stand, standpoint and all that good stuff. But then again, you also have, you know, stuff like the, the uh, mass transit issue where uh, I believe it was a, a Wade Keller who reached out to the uh, the head of the pay-per-view and brought up yeah. this uh, Eric Kulas incident, which initially got us derailed. But thankfully, uh, our fan base, a.k.a. Uh, the head of our fan base, Tony Lewis, who was a part of the crew Strictly ECW with uh, Chris Woodward, uh, Mike Johnson and a whole slew of other characters uh, got us back on track. Uh, they reached out and they uh, did a le letter writing campaign. They did calling, they did email and they pestered the living hell out of the cable company until he put us back on track. Uh, it is what it is. I mean, we, we, I think we did great by 97, you know, doing it in 97 storyline wise. We, we had some really good stuff going on in 96 uh, where were you ready again? Like I said, we were as ready as we never were because, you know, we, we did the evasion angle, but we never did live TV. All our stuff was taped to uh, edit, you know, everything was done in post. And that was great. Yeah, our TV shows were basically the sizzle reel to advertise for our home videos, buy our home videos, come to the live event, stuff like that. You know, people think ECW was just nothing but blood and guts and all that stuff. But we had some good wrestling on the shows. But we just showed all the other stuff to make you buy the home video and come to the live events. So speaking of the live event, uh, let's get started with this. The, uh, the event began to the live audience with two dark matches. The first one being Louis Spicoli uh, pinning Balls Mahoney at the five-minute mark. How important was that match for that crowd on that night? Joel? Um, to kick off, I, sh I should say, to kick off the show. How important uh, was it to really kick off the show um, and and to put those two in that spot? They were both starting out, um, but they were both guys that had been to WWE. Mm -hmm. So it was very important to put guys out there that you could show could be elsewhere, but are deciding to be on that night in ECW. Uh, but beyond that, uh, in early 97, Luis Spicoli is probably a few months maybe into his ECW run. Uh, and Balls also had, by and large, just started. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was a way to utilize two guys, great hands, super talented, great in the ring. Balls would be able to utilize Louis' style. Louis would be able to hang with Balls. Both guys could go. They didn't have a previous... Um, they didn't have any grudge with each other, but it was just a way to get some good wrestling out there. Guys who were going to move around, test the cameras, uh, and, and warm up the crowd and keep them enthused until the advertised and build matches start. Cause you don't want to go with complete, you don't want to go with maybe two kids out of Taz's school because right. God forbid they get too frightened and, and they're out of their element it could really maybe, you know, hamper the crowd, bring things down. But this was the kind of thing where it was a solid, solid match that could have been an on-camera opening match for a WCW or WWE pay-per-view, and we're giving it away as a dark match. And that's kind of, maybe I, I didn't phrase it properly, but that's kind of what I mean is that opening match for the, for the audience there, that sets the tone for the start of the, the entire show. And that's why I'm asking, and Meany, uh, if you could answer this too, what, why was that match so important to the show? If you can explain to people why putting that match out there was important to the entire show. Uh, to Joel's point, uh, you have two guys with, uh, who've been to WWE and have TV experience. Uh, we had TV experience, but we didn't have live TV experience. Uh, you know, balls had been there, uh, as Santa Claus and, you know, doing various, uh, 
you know, uh, an amazing my- run, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, Louie had been there as well. So, uh, and they were, they were, they were, you know, uh, they were known commodities, mm-hmm. you know, as Joel said, if you had put two, you know, if you go to Monday night raw, sometimes they had the dark matches to see, you know, to you know, test out new talent to see how they interact with the crowd. But the most important thing for any show is the opening match. Uh, you know, they set the, they, they set the tone for the, for the night. They get the, the fans lathered up, so to speak. And then, uh, you know, once, you know, the camera gets rolling, the fans have a little, you know, a few belts in them, <laughs> you know, because that crowd didn't need our, our front crowd was so rowdy. They didn't really need much prying. They had been waiting for this moment forever, just like the wrestlers in the ring. Uh, everybody felt how special this show was. So when uh, it came to, you know, having a couple dark matches, you know, to set the cameras and, you know, all that stuff, but I also set the mood in the building for a, a fan base that had been, I mean, they would, they, they, our ECW fans at these ECW arena shows would be at the building at 9 a.m. waiting to get into the show. So now you add in the element of live TV, pay per view. This means the company's growing a little bit. The company's going to do a little bit better. Uh, it, it is important for everybody, not, you know, just Paul Heyman, but the boys and the fans. So there was another dark match. Um, Chris Chetty had a mystery partner who ended up being the returning JT Smith. Uh, and they defeated Little Guido and Tommy Rich. Meltzer wrote, Smith got a surprisingly huge pop returning to ECW against the FBI gimmick that he pretty much started. Um, and then we're off to the pay-per-view. We, the show opens with the great uh, Joey Styles. And for those just tuning in now, uh, I'm Josh Chernoff, not Joey Styles, if that's who you were expecting to see here. <laughs> um, but Joey's standing in the middle of the ring. And I remember for me... Uh, the first thing that stood out to me was the production quality and the difference from what I saw on TV on Channel 48 here in Philly. Um, The canvas had the ECW logo on it. The lighting seemed significantly better, so much so that you can see the sign uh, being held up in the second row that I believe said Bischoff takes it in the ass. So there's that. Um, However, that's literally what you're seeing. You tune in the pay-per-view. That's the first sign that's out there. Um, Tremendous. However, things, uh, they did get off to a, a slightly rocky start. Um, as all you could really hear was the house mic. Um, Joey's microphone was not going directly into the pay-per-view feed. So two questions here. One, do either of you remember any panic in the locker room over the audio issues? Um, and two, was there a better way to start this show than with Joey Styles? I think I can answer that second one. <laughs> well, I, if I could throw in a back to uh, the uh, other dark match it shouldn't have been a surprise that jt smith uh got the reaction he did because he was a ecw original uh going back to the very first shows of ecw that crowd knew who he was they knew what him being in a dark match on that pay-per-view signified uh that was the equivalent of you know when at wrestlemania when vince has the battle royal and tries to get everybody involved in the show He made sure JT Smith, a guy who had killed himself, you know, physically for that, that company, whether it be, you know, walking foot, you know, walking blindly off a a scaffold and blowing out his knee or going to dive on hack Myers and getting his knee pad caught in the top rope and coming up with a cantaloupe on the side of his head. You know, JT Smith gave his body to this business. JT Smith gave his body to ECW. So the fact that, you know, Melter said surprisingly good reaction. It, yeah, he was facing the FBI, but it was as a, a more of a, a tip of the cap, Paul's tip of the cap mm-hmm. to, you know, the, the the people who brought ECW to the dance, whether, you know, all the way back to Eastern Championship Wrestling. So, uh, but what better way to start off the pay-per-view with Joey Styles? Uh, the crazy part about that is in typical ECW fashion, Joey goes out there and his mic's not working right. and uh, you know, he's hitting it, hitting it, you know, hello, hello, hello. And you know, they're counting down. And it's, if you've scripted in this movie, somebody's like, Oh, that's just ridiculous. Somebody runs down, tosses a mic. He gets rid of the dead mic and three, two, one. So and that's the, uh, what the- happened then. So his microphone that was all set up, I'd imagine to the truck and, and, uh, 
for the at home audience wasn't working. So right. they handed them last minute a house mic so we could at least hear something. Yeah. I mean, you're going okay. live to the world and uh, the, the microphone's not working. But like the, the, the timing of it, it was just like right out of a movie, you know, sure. good mic in, bad mic out. And the, uh, the count, the, you, you know, you've hear, you've heard the countdown, you know, uh, on a rise and fall ECW with that, you know, just, and the crowd did, was so into it, you know, it was just, it was magical. Yeah. Um, Joel, do you remember any, uh, obviously that that was going on. Were you aware of any of the panic going on over the audio as somebody who we're getting a little ahead of ourselves was about to step into the ring and take that microphone from Joey Styles? Yeah, there, there are a, a moment or two where the mic that I have, you can see me kind of banging on it. You can see me banging on the top of it because I want to test it to make sure if it's hot or not. Sure. Um, gosh, there was panic all night. It was high intensity, high anxiety. Uh, there were there are urban legends still that we had enough juice for exactly the amount of time we were on the air and that right as we went off the air, we're going off the air. Uh, a transformer blew and the power went out. Like I've heard so many stories about so many different things uh, revolving around either the power or the transmission feed or the audio that night. Like Mimi says, it's like a movie, you know, um, it, it, we just, by the skin of our teeth, we got that show up and running. At around the one minute mark, uh, Joey is interrupted by the Dudleys along with sign guy and their personal ring announcer, a young man by the name of Joel Gertner. Uh, we get a nice uh, fuck you Devon chant. Uh, and he responded by calling the audience inbred. Uh, but an interesting thing to point out is that Devon went with shut the hell up instead of the F word, uh, which which Meltzer claims was, quote, kind of letting us know this show was going to be under control. Um, was there a lot uh, uh, backstage of just saying like, hey, I know what we normally do, but let's kind of like... Uh, let's be able to count on two hands the F words by the end of the night, as opposed to, you know, having to get the whole locker room's hands together. As far as I recall, no, uh, the most important thing on that pay-per-view was stick it to your times. Mm. Uh, because we had only X amount of satellite feed, uh, you know, to go live. And uh, eventually I'm, I don't want to have ourselves, uh, I don't get to have ourselves, but that becomes an issue, uh, during the main event. Yeah. So, uh, nobody really, there was really no, uh, edict handed down from uh, the mountain to watch those swear words. It was just a matter of please stick to your times. Cause we only have a little bit of time. Uh, we, we have this much satellite time. Well, if there was an edict, uh, handed down, it was not handed down to the audience. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> so as, as Joel, uh, as you stand in the ring, Devon says it's time to testify and we're off to a brand new open for the show. Uh, really a highlight reel that would become the intro moving forward, uh, with a nice new 3d logo at the end. I remember as a kid watching that and just kind of having that feeling. And this is why it was so important. That feeling of just like, oh man, okay, we're stepping up here. This is a whole new ECW. And that really was exciting because if you're, uh, especially a guy like me from growing up uh, out right outside of Philly, ECW, that, that was ours, you know, for fans like me. And, and so to see even just a new logo on the intro there was enough to just be like, yeah, we're going to make it now. This is, you know, the, the little engine that could is still going up that hill and it's, it's going to get there. Um, we come back to you, Joel, with a great yet somewhat subdued introduction. Um, had you not gone all in on the Joel insert something here, Gertner, uh, which I guess could have actually been something you would literally say. Um, but at that <laughs> time was, uh, was, was it that, or was there concern of like, Hey, Joel, we don't want you going all in on, on this. Uh, it might be a little too risque for that, er uh, that early in the show with all the worries, um, from networks. What was the deal behind that? Um, probably a little bit of everything. It was such a work in progress. My, um, you know, they started off so short. Like I think the very first one with an insert nickname here in between the Joel and the Gertner was, um, I'm just like Rubik's cube. The more you play with it, the harder it gets. Just those two lines. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, a couple of years later, by 99, it turns into like four stanzas of four. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it turns into like a minute or two long thing. But it used to just be more of a nickname. 
Um, but yeah, as I was watching this to remind myself, you're right. There was no nickname at all for this one. And I'm not sure whether it was more for time or more for the stuff that I put in before my name was more important thematically because it played upon us proclaiming once again that we were the greatest tag team in the world today. That match with the Eliminators was for more than just the tag team titles. It was for what the tag team titles represented, but it wound up almost being like a second prize, a reminder of what the first prize is, that the winner of this match would be the best tag team in the world today because that was their gimmick right. to in all of their promos about themselves, even when they weren't holding the title, claim that they should be because they were pound for pound and for all intents and purposes, the best tag team in the world today. So it was my job to, to try to take that when they don't have the titles even, to try to take their moniker from them. And I think psychologically it could have been that, but again, it could have been for content because other people were going to drop F-bombs and sex references. It could have been for time. Uh, it was probably a little bit of all of it. Everything we did, there was always somehow order amongst the chaos and reason amongst the disorder. Um, it's just, it's hard to remember in each instance why we did what we did. But yeah, I'm sure there was a reason. Well, it also seemed when I was watching it back uh, the other day that it, it you really were putting that focus where a lot of times you would put focus on yourself as you should have. That was part of what people were coming to see. Um, on this night, it did feel very much like you were putting that focus on the match. It was much more about really putting over the Dudleys and really kind of putting over what this was all about, this match, as you just mentioned before. Um, Meltzer says, and this is something I want to ask you about, um, Joel Gertner did the ring introductions for this match doing his heel gimmick, which is actually mimicking how Michael Buffer announces, minus the trademark, let's get ready to rumble phrase, that Buffer will and has sued others over using. Joel is that true? Were you a Michael Buffer knockoff? Uh, no, um, not really. I mean, he was an influence just the same way Howard Finkel was an influence and Gary Michael Capetta was an influence. And I tried to take the best from what I enjoyed of everybody and yet still be myself. Um, I, was I supposed to be out there almost like you know, BWO style, like the same way in the BWO, you have, you know, Thomas Rodman out there as Rodman, and you have Rob Feinstein 7-Eleven out there as six. Was I supposed to be for the Dudleys, the knockoff Michael Buffer? No. Right. Um, but, but, you know, that's interesting that he, that he felt that way and saw that, um, you know, in, in what I was doing. Uh, the Eliminators come out to challenge the Dudleys for the tag titles. Uh, the belts, I remember... Um, really digging these belts. Uh, they looked like the Intercontinental title belts at the time, the tag belts. Uh, and the TV title looked like the Winged Eagle, um, which I always thought was kind of interesting when you're choosing the designs for championships that they were based off of other titles that didn't necessarily match up in the WWF. But um, just a little fun fact there. Uh, they started off with the total elimination on Sign Guy. Uh, after that, I thought it was great how they, uh, they went right into a solid wrestling match, showcasing the Dudley strength and the Eliminator's agility. Um, no chairs, no tables, as the Dudleys would become known for later in WWE. Uh, Meltzer pontificated that the idea of this match was simply to showcase the Eliminators and to keep repeating the, quote, best tag team in the world phrase so much that people actually believe it. This was similar in substance to a combination squash, squash match and lucha match with green flyers. The Eliminators' moves were out of this world and the Dudleys were good in their role, which is simply to catch them and take the moves without anyone getting hurt. Actually, that didn't quite happen as Bubba Ray Dudley suffered a broken ankle, the only serious injury of the show, and was hospitalized that night. Uh, at that time, he's currently on crutches and will be fitted for a cast this week. Do you guys remember... Uh, the injury, um, what was the backstage reaction to that, to this match? Uh, Joel, did you know? Meanie, we can start with you. You raised your hand very politely. Um, 
<laughs> but Joel, then I, I do want to come back to you because uh, you were out there at the time. Did you know what happened at the time? But Meanie, yeah, what do you remember? Well, I, I don't know. I, I hope I'm not stealing Joel's thunder. Uh, but uh, Bubba's ankle had already been broken prior to the show. And he, 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 he ripped off his, the cast off his leg to wrestle that match. So his ankle was already busted up and he had to take a cast off his leg and slowly put on his boot so he can somehow walk to the ring and, uh, and, uh, make it through that match. So it wasn't busted out. I, I believe it wasn't busted. Am I right, Joel? It, it, it was, it was, it was, you busted. might be right. Yeah, no, you might be right. I don't necessarily remember him injuring his ankle on the show. So, uh, I, I think your, your timeline of it could be right. Yeah. I remember seeing him taking a cast off in the locker room and putting in slowly, you know, you know, they taped it up, got the boot on and how he walked to the ring. I have no idea. Uh, if I could jump back in time for a second, you said you were impressed by the, the 3d logo yes. that opened up the ECW pay-per-view. Most of the boys were impressed that they had painted the floor in the ECW <laughs> arena. Because you walk into this to paint it's the picture. Things. First. Yeah, for the paint the picture for those at home, you know, ECW was, uh, you know, they literally put lipstick on a pig for that pay per view. Uh, you know, they painted the floors. There was professional. There was a professional lighting ring rig above the ring. Later on, we we learned that uh, WWE had uh, help in uh, procuring that for ECW, which uh, we raged against the machine, but we're kind of sort of part of the machine. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we, there's there's a lot of things that impressed us going into that. You know, between you know, having uh, being civilized at a banquet, wearing suits the night before, to walk into the building that smelled great and uh, had a, a, a proper paint job, and then there's also uh, the factor that uh, Barry Blaustein was there with the crew from uh, Beyond the Mat filming for the documentary that would later get released in uh, early 2000. I, uh, we are going to talk about that at some point. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so, uh, it, it's good to clear up that Meltzer wasn't completely accurate about the, the ankle. Um, but he did thought he did think it fun to mention, um, the transitions between moves were awful. So if you were judging it as an indie match, it was great. And as a major promotion match, it was bad in some ways, that is apropos of a lot of ECW. Uh, Meltzer was not all critical, uh, as he did give Saturn props for his, quote, amazing elevation on his elbow, and, quote, that Cronus uh, Scorpio splash on Devon was really impressive given his size. Uh, total elimination on Bubba, and Saturn covers him for the win. The Eliminators are the new champions. Meltzer gave it two and three quarter stars. Um, Meltzer added that after the match, Joel Gertner then announced that the Dudleys won on points and were still <laughs> champions, and the Eliminators gave Gertner the total elimination. So, Joel, uh, a couple of things there. Number one, uh, and I want to hear from both of you, just the, the, that line from Meltzer about um, it being apropos of a lot of ECW, um, that it was you know great for an indie match, not great for a major promotion match. Um, I, I felt that he was maybe a little too hard on this match. Uh, in my opinion, maybe it's just my, my fan goggles going on. Uh, two and three quarter stars, not terrible, but just some of the comments that he made on it. Um, so your opinion on that, and then I would love to know about the stud muffin scoring system and uh, how much you enjoyed taking that uh, total elimination. Uh, stud muffin scoring system was a device that usually – um, employed a local sports score, a Philadelphia loss, either um, <laughs> their most recent basketball defeat or their most recent non-triumph in hockey or baseball. <laughs> and, and I would just, the next, you know, there would be like the Friday night game or whatever. And then on Saturday evening, I'd be out there um, at the house show or whatever, saying that the Dudleys won by a score of whatever to whatever, which was the same score that the Philadelphia local sports team lost by the previous night. So for those who got that, they got that. But it was a device. It was a way for us to win even if we lose. Um, total elimination was fun in its own way. Um, that's the kind of thing it's good to do when you're young 
Uh, I wouldn't want to take total elimination today uh, at age 45, but back then at age 21, um, it was an okay thing to do. Uh, those guys were pros. Uh, they nailed it. It was as spot on as it could be and as painless and harmless as it could be while looking as murderific as it did. Uh, at best, it was really a walk in the park and nothing to even mention. At worst, it was a touch of blood that I think I'm, you know, might let's call it bruised cartilage at absolute worst. But listen, I'm a non wrestler. I'm not out there getting cantaloupes on my head like JT Smith. I'm not out there blood, sweat, and tears. So, it, you know, if, if it's a little bit of bruised cartilage that's going to be an injury that lasts me a day, you know, me complaining about that would be like Mary Todd Lincoln complaining that at her night out at the theater, the actors were mailing it in a bit. You know what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, oh, so, man. yeah, I mean, it, it, it was beautiful. It was spectacular. Um, it, I look back on it. It's a, it's a present. It's like the gift that keeps on giving that I can, as I did earlier today in refreshing myself about the show, I can turn on the WWE Network and I can watch a younger version of me take that bump, which has now been turned into like a meme or a gif. <laughs> and I can watch myself take that bump and it's all the glory and it's all the fun and it's all the pop without having to put my body to the test and actually take the bump again. How, uh, how important was it to you, um, such a, a diehard wrestling fan and a, a, a diehard member of the ECW team there, but as you mentioned, you were not a wrestler that was in there getting, you know, taking those bumps and everything that everybody else was in the locker room. Was it important to you to have an opportunity like that to say, hey, on this big stage, the biggest stage ECW's ever had, um, I'm with you guys. I know I'm not, I'm not, you know, in the ring putting on a match, but you want to hit me with something, hit me with something. I'm willing to do what I need to do to give as much as I can in my role to this company. Yeah, getting physical was a badge of honor for me. I wasn't fully trained as a wrestler. I'd probably gone to wrestling school and taken two classes, maybe one on a back bump and one on running the ropes, and that was the extent of it. All of the other training that I got was on the job, from the boys, with the boys telling me, tuck your head, protect your neck. This is how you're going to take this. This is what you want to think about when you're out there. This is what you don't need to worry about. I got you. And I'm taking Taz plexes and I'm taking moon salts that feel like a pillow fight from Big Dick Dudley. And I'm taking, I, I, by one time, probably by later in 97, after I'd been a heel for a year, I'd taken every heel's finish. Then in 97, 98, whenever it is, I'm taking Balls Mahoney chair shots and New Jack chair shots and New Jack tables. And it was a badge of honor, even though I never got an offensive move in there until for whatever reason they programmed me. I, I worked with Cyrus. I worked with Meany. Uh, those, yeah. those are the two names I remember best working against is Cyrus and Meany. And I never got a punch or a kick or anything in um, you know, a couple of years earlier when I was a heel manager, not in a wrestling match. And, but that was a badge of honor for me to be that kind of crash test dummy, where if I couldn't get out there and chain wrestle, if I couldn't get out there and, and provide in between the ropes, bell to bell, two star, three star, four star, what I was at least able to do is take everybody's finish when it was psychologically important to do so that it made for a better show. If I can add to uh, that, Joel, uh, so you, uh, you didn't have any offense, but there, there, you did one spectacular thing that I'm surprised doesn't get played more often is uh, there was a show in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and you broke a, pa a pane of glass over Perry Saturn's head. You took, you, there's like a, a, a giant like window pane of glass, and you just, whoo, and it was like one of the most spectacular things I've ever seen, and and all the replays in ECW history, I'm surprised that one wasn't played over and over again because that was like a legit pane of glass that you got him with, and uh, he took it like a champ. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you could fill books with the stuff that either happened, just stuff that kind of didn't make it off the cutting room floor, 
like Meany's talking about stuff that for whatever reason wasn't featured. Uh, there's so much of that stuff in the years of ECW. And then when you figure in backstage and behind the scenes stuff, I mean, you could fill another book or two with, with everything that, that doesn't get talked about. Um, later on in ECW, maybe towards the very end to try to save it, you want to talk about urban legend. You know, some of us are hearing that maybe there's talk about ECW becoming a reality show, similar to like what they have now with uh, Ms. and Mrs. or Total Divas or Total Bellas, where it seemed like maybe what ECW might become is half what it already was, an in-ring episodic wrestling show like the rest. And the other half would be the boys riding with each other to the town and in town and just show how crazy the extreme wrestling life was like. And I think the reason why we were given, if we were, if it's true, that we were being given serious consideration for the reality format towards the end, I think the reason for that is because our company and our troop and roster, we, I mean, it was, we had the kind of family and we had the kind of morale and bond that it would have made for riveting, compelling television to see these guys almost Hacksaw Duggan and Iron Sheik-esque <laughs> riding to the towns and through the towns together as family <laughs> and then going into the ring and killing each other. Yeah. Uh, and there, there was a moment too towards the end where uh, Jimmy Iovine, legendary record uh, producer, uh, produced Tom, uh, Tom Petty, Stevie Nicks, him and Dre created the Beats headphones. He tried to help ECW out as well because he had a show in the USA Network and they would do like a video package highlighting ECW action. So that could have been along the lines of what Joel is talking about as well. Uh, we go back to, after this match, we go back to Joey Styles, who wants to, uh, wants someone to inform Joel's parents that he is never coming home. Um, at this point, we, uh, we get a promo from the Sandman, but on the network, it's a video package uh, on the Sandman. Um, back to Joey and Candido is out in the ring. Chris Candido is out in the ring wearing a, uh, a sling. Um, he's out of this match because of bicep injury. He cut a promo on being with ECW from day one, leaving to be with Dr. Time and his girl, whose name he says he can't say because Bruce will get mad, which I thought was funny. Uh, the whole promo was great. Lots of shots at WWF, lots of threats, and then backpedaling. Uh, Chris Candido was was amazing. Do you guys have any uh, great memories of Chris Candido? Oh, absolutely. I, I love Chris Candido. Uh, talk about somebody who's made for the business, born for the business. Uh, and a lot of people forget that he was in ECW uh, well before he went to WWE. Him and uh, Johnny Hotbody were the, uh, the uh, Suicide Blondes. Uh, and they used to come at the in excess's song suicide blonde and they did the rib of it was, uh, Johnny Hotbody wasn't blonde. So, <laughs> so yeah, he was in East, he was in the original Eastern championship wrestling. Then when he went off and, uh, uh, worked for, he came up with Dennis Coraluzzo. Uh, the first time I ever saw Chris Candido wrestle, uh, myself was, uh, there was a, a wrestling radio show back in the late 80s, early 90s, Joel Goodhart's wrestling radio, and he had a square circle fan club. And we would take trips down to Memphis to watch wrestling. And it was somewhere in Arkansas, I want to say. Chris Candido was working for the USWA, and that's the first time I had seen Chris Candido wrestle. So all these years later of seeing him wrestle in ECW and then WWE and then comes back to ECW to a, a roaring response coming out the back and black by ACDC. He, sh he deserved to be on that pay-per-view and it's very unfortunate that he was injured. Uh, I mean, the guy was smooth. He was smooth as silk. Um, and he was a great wrestler, great promo. Uh, you know, just, uh, it's, it, I, I can't say enough good things about him, but, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a shame he couldn't have been on this, uh, first pay-per-view joel any memories of chris candido yeah every every one is a great memory i mm -hmm. you know now that now that the memories are, are are what we have um i feel like i'd be you know discounting all i mean i just every memory i mean chris was such a happy-go-lucky uh down-to-earth 
um, wanting to make everybody smile and laugh. Yeah. Um, he, he, re- he reminded me a lot of how mean he is. He reminded me a lot of how Axel Rotten was. Just a very, uh, just a really, really good guy, man. I, I went to a show in Jersey, maybe at like PNC or whatever it was called then. It might have been PNC. Uh, I think Poison. I went to see Poison. And, uh, and I ran into Chris and Tammy. And we were colleagues and we worked together, but we weren't, you know, I certainly wasn't as close with him as let's say Balls Mahoney or, uh, you know, a lot of the Jersey guys maybe that he trained with or came up in the business with. I was kind of like a work friend. We had never really hung out away from ECW. And he saw me there and he invited me to, he had a badge, he had a laminate. Um, He invited me to come hang out in VIP with him. And then to not have to go home late that night on the train or however it was that I got from New York to Jersey, he offered me to stay at their place and, uh, and opened his home up to me. Just, I mean, um, an unbelievable guy and I can't choose, but I mean, I guess I just kind of did that came to mind, but, um, hard to choose between memories of him because just a really, really good human being. Well, as we mentioned, uh, he was unfortunately injured. Um, but next up is the match. His, uh, replacement young guy by the name of Rob Van Dam who pinned the Lance Storm and his bleached rat tail uh, with the Van Daminator and a standing moonsault at uh, 10 minutes and 10 seconds. After the bout, RVD refused to shake Storm's hand and then cut an in-ring promo implying that he was going to jump to WCW. Um, in the match, Van Dam slipped on the rope. He did cover it up um, and still hit his back elbow. Uh, and Styles covered it uh, on commentary, but it was the first pay per view appearance, I believe, of the "You Fucked Up" chant. Um, <laughs> what did What did everybody, Meanie? I'll go to you on this. Um, not suggesting that you received that chant a lot, but what was backstage? What did the boys think about um, the "You Fucked Up" chant? Just straight up calling them on their shit in the middle of a match. So- yeah. Uh- I, I had a, a unique perspective of that. Like uh, before I got into the business, I was a fan of ECW. I was in the, in the crowd for ECW and I was one of those fans chanting you fucked up. Yeah. Now here I am on the other side of the barricade, so to speak. And uh, you know, fortunately for me, uh, I never had you fucked up chanted at me. So, uh, but uh, yeah, for not, a lot of the not boys, in the ring, at least um, not in the ring. No. Uh, so, <laughs> Back at the travel lodge. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, the cylinder of sin. Um, yeah, that, that whole building needed a condom put over it. Yikes. Uh, it was shaped for it. Uh, Van Dam was just starting the Mr. Monday Night shtick. Uh, ECW is known for having smarter fans, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, more aware of inside workings, maybe. But they really bought into the whole uh, Van Dam is going to leave thing. Um, they're not the only ones and we'll, we'll talk more about Meltzer in a minute, but, uh, did the boys ever worry that they were being worked into a shoot for lack of a, a, a better term, using some terminology there? Did they ever worry about that? Did they worry? Oh, Van Damme's just doing this whole like Mr. Monday night gimmick thing. Uh, but was there talk like, dude, this guy's just getting this whole thing over and he's going to show up on nitro on Monday or did everyone, or was everyone just like Van Damme's here? He's, you know. Um, I, you, that, you go ahead, bro. You sure? No, please, please, please. Pretty please. Yeah. I, what no, meaning? I was, about? I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that um, in this specific case, no, I don't think anybody was worried um, that it was a shoot uh, or that he was going to Nitro or anything like that in this specific case. Uh, and then almost in every case, um, y- even when it would have been worth worrying about, You're never worried about work shoot angles at that time in the mid to late 90s because they were the nature of the beast. What are you going to do? Go to WCW where you're just the boys are getting worked and you know what I mean? And on top of it, morale's terrible and whatnot. I mean, you know, if there's going to be something happening that's kind of shrouded or mysterious or do we have a partnership with this? Are we affiliated or working with that? 
is there really a mole? Todd Gordon <laughs> this, blah, 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 invasion that. If you're going to worry, you might as well wear a tin hat 24-7 if you're going to worry <laughs> about work shoot or the boys going into business for themselves or the office work and the boys or carrots being dangled that don't exist or any of it. If you're going to worry, this probably isn't the business for you. If it is the business for you, this is the company for you because there is the least of it in ECW that you do have to worry about. And with Van Damme, I think that falls into that category. I don't because he was getting the WWF exposure, because he was on ECW and Raw at the same time, while of course WCW may have courted him, wanted him, made him an offer. I don't think people were concerned that he might leave. And if he were to leave, you know, if that's what's best for him, that's just the nature of the beast. It's it's business. Uh, Meltzer's take on the match between Van Damme and Lance Storm was that it was, quote, another move fest. Fans chanted, you sold out at Van Damme since he's believed to be WCW bound. They are working an angle off that until he leaves. Um, I guess plans change. But Meltzer pointed out that Van Damme threw photographer Bill Apter out of the way which I found amusing. Um, but, uh, you know, Bill Apter, I don't know if you know this, but we talk about it on our show sometimes, Mind of the Meanie. Uh, Bill Apter is the George Napolitano of wrestling photographers. Um, um, Meltzer's opinion was they were having a pretty good match but killed it with the missed spots right near the finish. After the match, fans chanted to Van Dam, you sold out. Van Dam said he swallowed his pride to appear on this show as a second-line fill-in for the injured Candido, which was a shoot as Van Dam didn't want to appear on the show because he felt insulted he wasn't part of the original lineup. He said he swallowed his pride because with a win on this way, he'd be worth more money either here or, as he emphasized elsewhere, two and a half stars. Uh, first of all, it's hard to imagine... Uh, two and a half stars being given to Rob Van Dam versus Lance Storm. Now, this is obviously very right. early in their careers, but still. Um, do either of you remember RVD being upset about not originally being factored into the show? I, I do not uh, remember. I uh, recall him being upset. Uh, and, and going back to the whole work shoot thing, I don't think anybody really worried about that because – it was pretty much understood as much as we raged against the machine and when camera said fuck the wwe wwe was helping us with you know get exposure for the pay-per-view they had helped us with the lighting rig and just by chance rob had access to a perfectly good wwe banner to uh, carry around to the ring so it's pretty much that wwe and ecw were in cahoots so nobody really worried about that i don't think anybody really uh, took his comments in the ring as a shoot. Uh, you know, he, he might have been frustrated. He might have legitimately, legitimately been frustrated that, you know, he was a replacement. But backstage, he didn't uh, display any uh, emotions that would dictate that, you know, he was overly upset other than what he said in the ring. Um, Another thing I really noticed in the first two matches uh, before I got used to it was the sound of the ring. Um, mm -hmm. A bump sounded like a bomb going off, and then uh, just running the rope sounded like a, a gunshot. Um, it was loud. It was the, the, was it that loud in the arena, or was it just did they heavily mic a ring that really didn't need to be that heavily mic'd? I believe it was a... Uh twofold that you know we had a brand new ring and yeah they probably mic'd it just uh you know once you you start working with uh you know production and outside sources and outside powers to be i mean initially this uh the production company didn't want joey styles to be a part of well they didn't want him to be a one-man booth right you know they wanted, they didn't want ron and charlie in the truck they, they they want you know this production company wanted their fingerprints on the product so they probably just said, oh, we need to mic the ring kind of way, you know, kind of way you would mic a football game or something like sure. that just to uh, get sound. But uh, that's the only way thing I can think in, in the way of uh, possibly why the ring was so loud that the production company just said, look, we we have to mic the ring. It's uh, the only professional thing to do. That's 
my uh, my two cents. Um, next up, Joey Styles puts over Michinoku Pro in the upcoming match. Um, it was the Great Sasuke, Gran Hamada, and Gran Naniwa. Uh, I'm so sorry to fans of these people. Uh, they defeated Taka Michinoku, Men's Teo, and Dick to go. Um, Dick to go. I would uh, announce him uh, to the locker room. <laughs> uh, at 1656, when Sasuke pinned Michinoku with a dragon suplex. Uh, Michinoku. Hey, wait, or I'll be to go. <laughs> Did you say dick to go? Yeah. That sounds well, like dick a homosexual to- Uber Eats. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Dick to go. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so, Michinoku's team. I'm sorry, what was that? No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> that was meant to be said under something. Um, Michinoku's team wore BWO t shirts for the duration of the bout. Uh, before we get into Meltzer's unbiased take on this match, um, which co- uh, Beanie, how did the BWO Japan come about? And uh, are you still able to get those BWO Japan shirts at prowrestlingtees.com slash Oh, yeah. Uh, wink, wink. Uh, the BWO Japan came about because, you know, BWO being a parody of the New World Order uh, and uh WCW having a relationship with New Japan, it only seemed logical for you know the BWO to have allies in Japan as well with uh, Michinoku Pro. The Michinoku Pro guys were awesome, awesome guys. Uh, they did a, a bunch of shows around the loop, and then uh, that's when the uh, the thought came in: Hey, why don't we have them be BWO Japan? Be they could be our international representatives, just like you know uh, NWO had. You know, uh, all the New Japan guys be a part of it. Yeah, Chono, Muda, my favorite. Uh, yeah, so that that only seemed like the natural evolution of uh, them joining. Uh, we did promos uh, at the uh, the the raw uh, at the uh, the dog track in uh, Revere, Massachusetts, where uh, you know we were live via satellite, and they were in the uh, in the arena in, in Japan. And uh, we happened to barge in and uh, indoctrinate them into the BWO. So, uh, and they were so cool about it that even after this pay per view, and there really wasn't a relationship between Michinoku Pro and the ECW anymore, they still carried on the BWO Japan over in Japan for for a couple of years. Wow. Uh, Meltzer, not surprisingly, loved this match, um, calling it Shocker. quote. Yeah. Calling it, quote, the second best pay-per-view match thus far in 1997. Uh, This is the typical nightly main event match for the Michinoku Pro Wrestling promotion, which promotes mainly small towns in in northeastern Japan. Joey Styles compared it to a Japanese version of ECW, and it is similar in that both started in 93 and both have cult followings and both generally use smaller performers than the major companies in their respective country. The heel trio came in wearing Blue World Order Japan t-shirts, which they've been wearing for the past two months on their cards in Japan as well. The heel group is known in Japan as Kayentai, and these guys can really work. Fans threw streamers into the ring as a sign of respect for the guys, and Sasuke in particular got a nice reaction. Yakushiji, my apologies, subbed for an injured Grand Naniwa. I'm embarrassing myself. and was actually better than Naniwa, uh, would have been, although some fans chanted Power Ranger at him. Um, one thing that I caught was Joey Styles mentioning possible jet lag uh, for Sasuke saying he wrestled Jushin Thunder Liger the night before in front of 50,000 people in the Tokyo Dome. Uh, Meltzer was obviously and biasly complimentary of this match, uh, whereas he was a little stiffer on the homegrown ECW guys, but... Do you guys think, and Joel, we'll start with you. Do you think it was fair to say that this group may have been the more experienced in big match situations or no? Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps. Perhaps. You have guys that have worked. Uh, anybody who's worked the Tokyo Dome has worked a room much larger than the ECW arena. Um, much larger than where we topped out at. You know, we probably topped out at around 6,000 paid, 7,000 in the room. And, uh, and in Japan, um, 
you know, they, they may have very well been on bigger shows. Um, so yeah, a lot of those guys had a lot of experience and, uh, I think it was a great way to get a different kind of style and a different kind of flavor onto the show. Meanie, what, what, what's your take on that? Uh, these guys were more experienced when it came to, uh, big matches in Japan, but this is a whole new, uh, new world with, uh, wrestling in the United States and that's not a knock against them, but, uh, you know, uh, the, just like the ECW roster, they're exposing themselves to a, a whole new audience who may not have seen ECW where of course the ECW diehards are going to know who we were. Uh, the, the ECW diehards were going to know who, uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, kind folks, uh, we're going to be, uh, there's going to be the, uh, the casual fan that we were hoping to get to expose ourselves to, you know, in the ring, uh, yeah. but, uh <laughs> casual fans walking around outside the ECW arena that you're hoping to expose yourselves to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Michinoku guys, uh, this was brand new to them. Just the way it would have been brand new for one of us to go over to maybe work at Michinoku pro. Sure. Uh, and stuff like that. But, uh, I mean, we had a lot of guys on our, our on our or on our roster who had been in you know WWE, WCW. That's why we're the uh, land of misfit toys. We were part some of the talent that you know, uh, not myself specifically, but other people who had been talent that other companies didn't want. So, you know, uh, it's just a matter of uh, opinion, uh, so to speak. Uh, those guys were probably just as nervous as we were because it was live television in the United States in front of a lot of people who may or may not have known who we were. Uh, Sasuke finished the match with a Tiger suplex on Taka. The fans gave them all a standing ovation, a, a deep and sensual four and a half stars from Meltzer. Uh, I mean, this was hands down a fantastic match. Um, oh, don't get me wrong. Yeah, ECW was known for introducing so many different international styles to American fans. Um, what was the reaction in the back to a the match itself, but B this match of non full-time ECW stars taking a spot. I mean, you have balls, Mahoney, Luis Piccoli, uh, little Guido, all these mainstays on the pre-show. We talked about whether or not Van Dam was, uh, was upset or not. Uh, about not originally being factored in here. Um, was there resentment from any of the boys uh, about this that either of you saw? Meanie, we'll start with you. No, nah, not that not, not that I was aware of. Nobody said anything outwardly or anything because these guys had already, it's not like they just flew in that day and left. They had done a loop of shows with us, you know, earlier in the year. So everybody was familiar with the, the, the fellas from Michinoku. So nobody really... Uh, it was like, oh, they're taking a spot. I mean, if you look at it, Tommy Dreamer didn't have a spot on the Mr. ECW, the, sure. the hometown, the main state, the main baby face in the company wasn't factored into the pay-per-view for a match. The very first ECW pay-per-view. Yeah. So if, if Tommy Dreamer didn't have a problem with it, then nobody, nobody else in the locker room really said anything and was worried about them taking somebody's spot. It just, it just made us look bigger because we had that international flavor in my opinion. Next up, they aired a pre-tape with Stevie Richards. It was uh, very well done and showed a different side of him than I think we'd really ever seen at this point. Uh, he talked about being a loser his whole life. And of course, uh, the blue guy took it home with a message to Stevie's opponents. Um, Meltzer said, quote, I even wanted to cry when he talked about being picked last in kickball as a kid. The interview was so good. High praise and perhaps a uh, peek behind the curtain from Meltzer there. Um, Meanie, what was Stevie's mindset going into this entire event? Um, I mean, you obviously watched that promo uh, happen live as it, as it was going on. Uh, did, did you and he ever talk about what this opportunity meant to him? Uh, I mean, there was a lot of pressure uh, with Stevie going into this uh, match, but it, in, a, in a good way. Um, you know, he was... Leading up to the Stevie had been the lackey, you know, the flunky and, you know, me being a lackey to a lackey, you know, I, I, I came along for the ride and, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, Stevie went through a lot in ECW, whether it be in the ring or behind the scenes, uh, back then, you know, 
when uh, Raven was uh, grooming him and, and myself and Nova, he could be, you know, uh, not a taskmaster, a uh, taskmaster, but he could be a little rough on you to make sure. I mean, if you're going to work with him, that you know you knew your thing. So Stevie went through a lot of things physically. In ECW, he went through a lot of things emotionally. In ECW, uh, but it, in the end, it all made him stronger, and he deservingly so was put into the spotlight. And I think it was uh, an avenue like the Blue Ward Order that helped Stevie break away from uh, Ray- Raven's grasp, so to speak, to the point where uh, here he is in the semi-main event of uh, the pay-per-view leading into uh, hopefully winning and getting a shot at the world title. But I mean, uh, you really that- call it main, main event A, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it was... A little was inside baseball. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, uh, no, a little no inside baseball into necessary. that promo. Uh, we filmed that at the uh, airport uh, Marriott right there, uh, where a lot, of, a lot of the boys were staying. Uh, I forgot whose room that was, but uh, it was a hotel room at the airport Marriott. And th- that was just one take, uh, as far as I can remember. Because, I mean, it was some of the best promos are the ones that are real life. And uh, Stevie really didn't have to uh, research that one so to speak he, he spoke from the heart being picked last to kickball or uh, having somebody to take to the prom and stuff like that that was like real life shit he was talking about and uh little you know <laughs> we were in, in uh, the hotel room at the marriott and that was filmed in the bathroom and i <laughs> i had to stand inside a shower behind the curtain and a lot of people don't know that i just like peek my head around but like it's literally being filmed into a mirror uh, at Stevie and I'm, I pop out over his shoulder and uh, we talk about the three-way dance and Stevie's going to lead. Uh, that was a very powerful. Uh, uh, like I said, some of the best promos are the ones that are based in real life. And you felt that one. Um, was there any sign of uh, severe nervousness or fear from Stevie spending that much time with you, meaning in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of, you know, just, you know this is. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, up, <laughs> well, up take number three, three man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some, some, some of Meanie's, some of Meanie's farts should come with license plate numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, uh, a little inside baseball, a little shout out. Uh, one time we, me and Joel were on this awful show in uh, <laughs> Virginia. Uh, I forget where in Virginia, uh, but right on the border. And uh, nobody showed up. The boys weren't getting paid. So we all went to business for ourselves uh, during the show. So Joel gets the um, microphone and does a promo. Uh, well, the owner of the car with the license plate and he lists off this fucking license plate, like ABC, you know, a ridiculous amount of letters and numbers. He goes, please move your car. Your license plate is blocking the other fans from coming inside the building. <laughs> <laughs> One of my yeah. favorite Joe promos <laughs> ever. That was a great show, man. We, the boys were passing a hat around in the first few rows. And the variety <laughs> Headbanger, show and actual. as long as there was being money put into the hat. It was amazing. Awesome. Uh, the headbangers and Axel were passing around the hat, and then the uh, headbangers start doing karaoke singing Adam Sandler's yeah. at a medium, yeah. medium pace. Wow. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I had to bring that up. Just uh, great memories. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, well, up next on the show, we have uh, the ECW TV champion Shane Douglas with his head cheerleader francine uh he pinned pitbull number two with the belly to belly suplex at 20 minutes and 44 mm-hmm. seconds uh Meltzer was not kind to this match or anything uh, during this segment uh he said quote lighting was horrible early in this match um to clarify the lighting was fine shane douglas's entrance included smoke machines which took a while to dissipate um, but Hey, he also added that quote, Douglas did a pre-match promo talking about going to cartoon land and saying he calls out guys from other promotions who don't have the balls to answer his challenge. 
Uh, Meltzer acknowledges that even though they weren't called out by name on this show, Shane was talking about Shawn Michaels and Ric Flair, who Dave mentions could put on a better match than this one, quote, blindfolded with a crippling fever. Uh, The match wasn't going to win any awards, but the story leading into it was great. The story with Pitbull Gary Wolf uh, was real and intense, and Shane's promo, I thought, was great. Uh, Meltzer acknowledged that the guys worked hard, but suggested that maybe the match went too long and he may not have been wrong on that. Uh, Meltzer gave the match three quarters of a star, which I thought was way too stiff. Um, The match told a story and furthered the Gary Wolf angle and, of course, the masked man angle, which saw the masked man appear wearing Rick Rick Rude's uh, trademark robe. He came (laughs) in and kissed Francine, did the hip gyrations and all until Douglas attacked him from behind, at that point, one of Douglas's riot guards wearing a motorcycle helmet climbed in the ring, took off the helmet, revealed himself to be Rick Rude. Uh, the masked man revealed himself to be Brian Lee. Rude punched Douglas right into a choke slam by Lee. Uh, Meanie, we've talked about this before on our podcast, Mind of the yeah. Meanie, available every Monday wherever you listen to podcasts. Not an ad, just something I'm mentioning. Uh, so we're going to start this one off with you, Joel. Um, what did it mean to ECW and what did it mean to you to have Rick Rude as a part of the team? It meant a lot. It meant a ton. Um, gosh, Rude was somebody I admired growing up, uh, somebody I met at a wrestling convention when I was a teenager, uh, somebody I had watched Paul manage in WCW, um, Bobby Heenan in WWF, just, uh, I'd been following his career since Texas, and uh, it, it meant a whole lot to have both of them there with us. Uh, every bit of exposure and validity and um, just every bit of acknowledgement that we were at that level, not just the alternative, but in the big three, just like back in the eighties, you had WWF and NWA and then AWA wasn't so much looked at as an alternative. They were looked at as having a world champion being bigger than the others in certain parts of the country and being number three in a three-way war. And just to be kind of on that level, um, it it meant a lot. Uh, Meanie. For what did it mean to you to have Rick Rude there? What was your experience having him in the locker room? Oh, it, it meant a lot. Um, and uh, to uh, add to the fact that uh, that this was like a bit that WWE eventually went on to uh, steal with the uh, riot, the people in riot gears with the helmets, and then the guy attacks and reveals himself to be, you know, so-and-so that, that was a, some WWE eventually went up barring down the line. Uh, to add to the, uh, the segment, uh, when you, we talked about the reaction of the boys in the back and stuff like that, one of the biggest reactions from the boys in the back was when Brian Lee was walking down to that ring with Rude's robe on and the, uh, the, the mask with, and he, he stuck purposely stuck his chin out like Rick, uh, like a Rick uh-huh. Rude, that Rick Rude solid chin. So probably one of the biggest reactions of the, of the night besides the obvious ones was, you know, the boys in the back popping for Brian Lee walking down as Rick Rude with the, uh, with the robe and everything like that. But, you know, Rick Rude added definitely, you know, just like Terry Funk years before added a, a level of credibility to the fact that when he debuted for ECW, he goes, it's a new year, Shane Douglas. Fans automatically knew who oh, it yeah. was. You, they didn't even need to see him. They heard the voice and reacted to the voice. So to have him in that locker room, uh, and like I said, there's a lot of unsung heroes of ECW, uh, you know, with Tracy Smothers, who would take the boys in the ring for the show and train us and stuff like that. Sometimes Rude would get in there too. I show the boys some stuff and it shows some guys like some stuff as far as like self-defense if Hey, if you're ever in the ring and somebody tries to get cute, will you do this, do that, do that other thing? Cause he was a legit badass. You know, he could do a thing where he just grabbing a bear hug, take his chin and put it on your collarbone and have you in tears. 
you know, just he could break your collarbone with his chin. So he would just do like little things like that to help give back to the boys, uh, train the boys. And uh, he gave back to ECW, whether it was in the ring before the show or doing play by play later on down the line with Joey Styles. He, he gave us that uh, that recognition of, you know, being legit. Next up, we get a classic Raven promo uh, that at one point looked like it was headed into Scott Steiner math territory with all the talks of uh, of percentages. Um, but it was it was real. Uh, it was Raven at his finest, in my opinion. Um, I would love to see Raven that character through the eyes of a current teenager because I'm curious how much of that very 90s grunge attitude would translate today um, to today's youth. Uh, but man, in its time, it, it, was, it was excellent. Meany, um, let's talk about Raven. How smart was he back then? I know he still, he still is, but man, uh, did he have his finger on the pulse of society? He was just a creature of everything. Just... Uh... You go to his house and it'd be filled with books. He was constantly reading, uh, constantly, uh, you know, listening to music or getting influence from music and stuff like that to the point where sometimes song lyrics would bleed over into his promo, but in a way where you really, really wouldn't go, Oh, he's just quoting this thing. You would just hear him subtly working like something, something, so, so, something as simple as a, a Goo Goo Dolls lyric. And it would fit the narrative of his storyline and the match to the point where you, you hear something you're familiar with. You go, oh, yeah, yeah. Stuff. You know, scars are souvenirs and the past is never far. I remember him working that line into a promo from a Goo Goo, from Goo, Goo Gals, uh name. The song was called Name. I would know. Yeah. And, uh, no, please like, continue. Can we get more of that? No. no. <laughs> if you want a karaoke, you'll have to get the Michinoku guys on for that. Uh, big karaoke guys. Um, but uh, yeah, dude, he was he was brilliant. He was ahead of his time. Uh, a lot of the stuff he they do now down at the performance center where they they call them skull sessions. He was doing with me or guys in the locker room where you he'd sit in the middle of the room and you'd stand there and he'd throw out a topic and you'd have to do a promo on that thing. And uh, a lot of times before shows, uh, if a, the building had an AV cart, like TV, VCR, all that stuff, he would bring in TV and we'd watch Southeast Wrestling. And he'd be putting, you know, talk, he'd be talking out loud about the match and explaining the psychology of the matches and stuff like that. He was another one who gave back to the, the business, gave to the boys. A lot of us learned from him on the art of cutting a promo. So, you know, with him, it was all about cadence and, you know, thinking about what you're going to say before you say it. Like, you know, I'm talking to you right now, but I'm thinking maybe 20 words down the line of where I want to end up. Mm -hmm. he, he was really good with helping, you know, folks think on the fly and uh, be intelligent and not yelling and uh, drawing you in like a Jake the Snake Roberts kind of kind of promo. Jake was a big Jake the Snake Roberts was a big influence on uh, Raven. Now, Joel, you obviously, um, you know, your reputation for all of your promos, all of your lines, um, did, I, I feel like you and, and Raven, he would be somebody that you would look at and be impressed by his promos. What was your, what was your relationship like with him did, back then? Did you ever get an opportunity to kind of pick his brain or learn from him at all? I, I wish that I could have been mentored more by him. There was a personal circumstantial event that happened uh, aside from you know any wrestling arena but there was something that happened kind of real life that he initially believed i had something to do with that i didn't and years later we talked we hashed it out we buried the hatchet um i've worked with him on podcasts uh we have a great relationship now um, unfortunately, during ECW, he held me a little bit more at arm's length. There was that miscommunication, and he didn't know me as well. He just, I guess, knew a version of me that he had thought. So long story short, to answer your question, 
my personal relationship with him, unfortunately, was not as good as I ever wished it would be. But professionally, I don't know what he might have thought about me, but I always held him and still do in the highest regard with the highest reverence. Uh, when I was Joey Jaguar before ECW working the indies as a teenager, alongside being patterned like a teenage Paulie Dangerously or a teenage Jim Cornette, because the character was more of a silver spoon kind of rich entitled punk gimmick, I very much um, patterned myself also uh, to be a Scotty Flamingo type in the sense that um, I was billed from Flamingo Drive in West Palm <laughs> Beach. So wow. I was, I definitely loved his Portland work, his WCW work. I had been following his career pretty much from the beginning through the sheets and through tapes. And uh, professionally, nothing but the highest regard for him. Personally, I always loved him. I knew he was a genius. I knew that he himself was probably very misunderstood. I knew that he himself was probably perceived by some to maybe be haughtier than he was. Uh, Scotty's just Scotty. He's a genius, and sometimes that's not well understood. Um, so I kind of did did my best to understand that. So yeah, you know, I loved Scotty, still do, uh, and I'm glad that he and I are on much better terms now. Next, we we hear from Taz. Uh, I was a huge Taz fan, still am, uh, but this was just, this to me was so damn good. Uh, watching this back this week, remembering as a fan, um, a calm, collected promo that ran down a who's who of the victims uh, to the Katahajime, the Taz mission. Uh, knowing what I know was about to happen, um, it's almost a bittersweet promo as the team of Taz and Fonzie, to me, was great. Um, so that promo brings us right into the first of our main events and possibly the biggest draw of the card. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on that. It was billed as the grudge match of the century. Taz comes to the ring surrounded by Team Taz. Uh, Joel, you had said something earlier about Taz's students. Um, is that who Team Taz was? Yeah. Do we know anyone who came from Team Taz eventually made it to ECW? Um, yeah, Team Taz is where we first saw the likes of Danny Doring, Chris Chetty, Roadkill, um, Prodigy Tom Marquez, Meanie, help fill in the list for me if you can. I believe that's pretty much the only people who graduated from the uh, uh, hard, House of Hardcore uh, wrestling school because it was designed not to have a, overabundance of graduates. The, the graduate from House of Hardcore meant you really were the best of the best because Taz and Perry Saturn, uh, they were taskmasters when it came to, came to the training and stuff like that. But they trained you in the right way, and you really had to be physically and mentally tough. So. If as far as people who made it out of that team, Taz, uh, entrance way uh, entrance, I believe those, the ones you listed are the, the ones who, who are, who made it. I think maybe Martian boy might've been one of them, but he was uh, more yeah. of Tommy's, Tommy's, uh, best friend that he was an extra body more than a, a Taz student. Uh, so Taz is standing in the corner and Sabu just charges the ring, not waiting for his introduction, which I thought was a creative start to the match. Joey Styles calls out the smart marks and tells them that these two really hate each other. Um, in your memories, Meany, we'll start with you. What, what, what do you remember their relationship backstage? Uh, uh, what was it like? It was kind of rocky. Yeah, it was, kinda, but not in a, it was more of a, a rival rivalry way. Uh, I mean, they had issues going back to when Taz was the Tasmaniac, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, Taz and Sabu were tag team champions. And then uh, Taz, no, I mean, uh, Sabu no showed for New Japan. And Taz and Paul Heyman publicly fired Sabu in the ring. And then Sabu comes back. <clears throat> and for a year, Taz calls out Sabu each and every week. And Taz doesn't reply or doesn't get a chance to uh, retort, so to speak. 
<clears throat> which uh, Taz, I mean, Sabu wasn't really a fan of. He's like, what the fuck? I look like a pussy just standing here. He's, he's calling me out. Blah, blah, what the fuck? If you know Sabu. <clears throat> and then they had uh, their series of pull aparts uh, leading up to the pay-per-view. And there was one infamous one where uh, all the boys are pulling the guy, uh, Taz and Sabu apart. And, you know, one will break away and then they'd pull him back and the other guy would break away. And they're just you know, motherfucking each other, you know, in there and saying some things I, I won't repeat. But, uh, yeah, there's a, a bit of a contentiousness between the two. But it had more of a <coughs> more of a uh, professional uh, competitiveness. You know, like two guys would motherfuck each other on a football field but you know behind the scenes you know they're making money together so they're they can't hate each other that much you know yeah. but uh, you know uh, yeah they, 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 they there's there's a little bit of tension in the air between those two joel is that what you remember too yeah same thing um they were great rivals that you know they formerly they were a tag team together and uh they shared a lot of the same experiences and there were similarities but there were differences and it was just a very, very unique relationship. And what was seen on camera between the two of them was kind of very much an art imitating life kind of deal. Yeah. All right. On to the match. Uh, Taz with Bill Alfonso defeated Sabu with the Taz mission. 17 minutes and 48 seconds. Meltzer wrote, Taz dominated early with mat work and viciously cross-faced Sabu a number of times. Meltzer reports that Sabu may have broken his nose and it may have been a planned spot to get over the stiffness of the match, although one live report was that they believe Sabu bladed his nose to get the blood. I need to take a pause right there because uh, the idea that he bladed his nose was so crazy to me that I went and studied the spot. (laughs) And if you go to the WWE Network at the 1 hour, 39 minute and 15 second mark, you can actually see where it appears that Sabu cut his freaking nose. Um, does that, ex- ex- I, you know, I don't want to expose the business here, but does that expose the length in which that man will stretch his body for this business, uh, Meanie? doesn't surprise me one bit, uh, considering everything he had worked with leading up to this spot of him gigging his nose. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my favorite Sabu stories was as a teenager, he was at a high school party. Somebody pulled out a gun and shot and Sabu wound up getting shot in the face and uh, leading to, you know, him to this day, still having uh, shrapnel in his face, bullet fragments permanently in his face. I didn't know that. So the moment when uh, Chris Benoit <laughs> suplexes Sabu and Sabu lands right on top of his head, breaking his neck. They rush him to the hospital and they go, uh, Terry, he goes, Sabu. You know, Cause he took that shit serious. You know, him and Al Snow will be on the phone and you know, Al will go, Hey Terry, he goes, oh, it's Sabu. He's like, dude, it's just me and you on the phone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but like Benoit breaks Sabu's neck. They go, Terry, he goes, Sabu. They're like, uh, do you know you have bullets in your face? He goes, I know I was there when that happened, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the man. man lived his entire life with bullet fragments in his face. He, yeah. he wrestled with a broken neck. Uh, he broke both the t- on a table spot in Japan. Both and his wrestled- what? It cut out for a second there. What did he break? He broke both his hands. Oh, jeez. broke both hands in Japan on a table spot to where he had to he taped padding almost like boxing gloves so he could continue to work because if you don't work you don't get paid so and he worked through that so and uh, the, the fact that you know oh and you know the whole thing with his scars mm-hmm. and bob wire he would purposely you know run the the bob wire across his body and then instead of getting stitches he would crazy glue them shut and all that scarring and stuff that was almost by design uh, so the fact that he bladed his nose against Taz to make it look more believable doesn't surprise me one bit. There's a lot of times where people go uh, talk about Sabu botching stuff, and yeah, here and there he would botch stuff. But I know for a fact Sabu purposely would botch something. Like 
he would go for the triple jump moonsault and get on the top rope and act like he lost his balance and jump on his, you know, jump down and then redo. He goes, well, fuck Babe Ruth doesn't hit a home run. Every time he goes to bat, you know, he wanted things to look, he wanted things to look believable. Well, so is- so I, sometimes he would just purposely do things to where, you know, the crowd's going, you fucked up, you fucked up. But he's like, ha, ha, I worked those fucking marks and they thought I'd watch. <laughs> Um, it's interesting you say that because, uh, I don't even know if this is still in my notes, but I do remember reading from the observer and Meltzer did point out a lot of the, uh, the botched moves in this match by Sabu. Um, one of them was that triple jump. Uh, well, no, I guess it was where he jumped to the chair, jumped to the ropes and then to fall back down into the ring and then did it again. Kind of went a lot of that stuff was by design. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sabu would would go on to do some of his iconic flips and dives. And Meltzer added that Taz did some UFC spots with Sabu, but it didn't seem to register with the crowd. And when he maneuvered into the arm breaker, the crowd didn't react at all. Although the fans seemed into the match big time as they were intensely watching, it came off as dead because of lack of noise compared to the wildly enthusiastic crowds at WCW shows. Uh, man, that's not a statement you would have said a couple of years later. Um, right. I'm not saying I take issue with that opinion, but I have to tell you, I would much rather see a match where the crowd is laser focused on the action as opposed to a match where the crowd is staring at their phones, you know, until I guess Pavlov rings the bell and they start chanting fight forever or whatever. Um, but uh, Taz, I digress. Taz hit a, a, a few Taz plexes and locked in the Taz mission for the win. Meltzer reported fans were pretty stunned to see Sabu submit at the end. Uh, Perhaps because Sabu, in fact, did not submit and instead was choked out and the referee stopped the match, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, After the match, Taz got on the mic and said that Sabu uh, took him to the limit and that he respects Sabu. Meltzer would say fans, at least the vocal ones, seemed disappointed in the match and were booing Taz for praising Sabu. Both shook hands and hugged, and both were heavily booed at that point, um, which I saw on the video as well. Meltzer would guess that it was, quote, because they spent more than one year building up how much they hated each other, and then they hugged after the first match, which was a good match to be sure, but to some people, anything short of match of the year would be a disappointment after all the hype. Uh, He continues, Rob Van Dam hit the ring and jumped Taz and began arguing with Sabu, Taz was about to destroy Van Dam when Sabu jumped Taz and the two of them kicked the hell out of him, uh, starting the double turn. Meltzer criticized how long the table spot took. This is what I was talking about before. um, And then discussed uh, Bill Alfonso's turn. He pointed out that the, quote, entire show was scripted eight weeks ago and sent to request TV for approval. So this double turn idea was formulated and completed long before WWF did the same thing in the Hart Austin match. He added that Alfonso kind of blew the mic spot to explain why he did it. Van Dam then said uh, how much he loves to work on Mondays, again, building up to his quote, eventual WCW leaving as a way to get heat. As long as he sticks around, um, Meltzer really thought Van Dam was leaving. Um, <laughs> uh, he ended up giving the match three and a quarter stars. Uh, what was the backstage reaction? Joel, we'll start with you here. What was the backstage reaction to this match? Uh, what was the reaction to the booing um, at the end there? And was there a feeling that this was kind of falling flat, this, this uh, double turn, this altercation that was happening when, once Van Dam got out there? Uh, look, we lived by the sword. We died by the sword. We lived with the halo effect that we had amongst our fans. So you can't fault them out of one side of your mouth for screaming, you fucked up, you fucked up, when they're the same ones that are chanting EC dub, EC dub. Yeah. So the same way, I tutor math. Every now and again, I will do my job well enough that I have cost myself a repeat customer Mm -hmm. because I have gotten my student so good at math that they're ready to fly and they no longer need me and they don't book me. So ECW, in doing what they did with Taz and Sabu, 
hugging it out, weren't doing anything that Rocky movies, actual boxing, or actual MMA weren't doing, and certainly now, years ahead of time, aren't doing. Because now, like Mickey Mouse walking down Main Street, you'll watch two guys for six months, they're building it up. They hate each other. They hate each other. They're about to gnaw each other's arms off at the weigh-in and the press conference. And then when it's all said and done, it's good sportsmanship. Right. We did it because we built up Taz and Sabu with so much realistic hate so well. We got momentarily bit in the ass by the fans who thought it was unrealistic that after not touching for a whole year, hating each other, that they should end it with a hug and a show of respect. We got temporarily burnt for doing our job too well, is the way, that's what my takeaway was from it. It's interesting. Manny, what did, what's your take on uh, the story with it? Bill Alfonso turns on, uh, on Taz, says Taz cost him a lot of money bec- by winning the match because he put all of his money on Sabu, um, but at the same time, he's wearing a Sabu t-shirt underneath the Taz t-shirt. It was very um, convoluted in a way to me, which I didn't really see that very much in ECW storylines. What was your take on that? Did you think that came off as well? Obviously, there was an idea, uh, and I'm sure a great idea because the way it panned out eventually was fantastic. But in that moment, it, it watching it back now, something just, it didn't gel right to me. What was your take on it? Uh, first of all, I think, in my opinion, they booed the match because Taz was a heel. <laughs> yeah, you boo heels. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> going back to, you know, uh, sorry, Dave. Um, but, uh, oh, Fonzie's promo. Yes. Uh, what it was proposed to say and what it, it came, how it came out might have been not mutually exclusive because Fonzie's a little bit of a uh, a live wire and he could have been just excited and it could have could have came out a little bit di- differently than it was supposed to. Uh, when it comes to seeing remembering this match live, I was a little bit. Uh, it's a little fuzzy to me because we were the next match coming up. And we were, me and Stevie uh, and Raven, I mean, me, Stevie, Sam, and Terry were uh, off into a, in, on a certain part of the locker room going over our deal because we were getting ready to go right out. But um, uh, the double switch, um, it was interesting. I think they did, they, they went as long as they could with uh, Fonzie being Taz's Don King, so to speak. And maybe uh, in the same vein as Don King turning on Tyson when uh, Tyson served him, didn't serve him as well a- anymore. You know, it was kind of like art imitating life, you know. You know, uh, you know, uh, Te- Bill F- Belafonte was Tez's promoter, his Don King. And then the fact that, you know, you know, uh, maybe uh, Fonzie didn't believe in Tez enough to, uh, to beat Sabu that he actually put money on Sabu to win and hence, you know, screwed him out of the money the way, uh, you know, everybody was hoping, you know, Ty- you know Tyson would have been, uh, Tyson would have beat B- Buster Douglas and everybody lost money, you know, and, and, and to Tyson's credit, he kind of said he, he purposely went into that fight to, to, to screw over Don King because he was tired of living that lifestyle. So it's kind of off, it was kind of like off that kind of, in my mind, in my opinion, I wasn't in on the booking meeting on it, but this is what I, as an observer, no pun intended, got out of it. Not the observer, but eh, observer. Um, observer. What what do you guys know of, uh, speaking of the observer, uh, this idea that uh, the script was written eight weeks ago and sent to request TV for approval? Is there any truth to that? No no idea. No idea. Any idea? Uh, I don't know much about that. It sounds like it passes the sniff test Mm -hmm. that the script in general had to be approved in advance. Uh, The eight-week time frame would be something I have no idea about. 
I mean, regardless whether it's true or not, um, the show that went on is not the show. If nothing else, Chris Candido um, being taken out, you know, it's, it's obviously anyone who has ever even, you know, walked past a, a, the, the door of a group of people who are planning a wrestling show, you know that the show that airs that night is not the show that you had planned even that morning. So hard subject to change. Yes. Um, but I, yeah, I guess I could, I could get behind the idea of, of that, that they sent at least a rough, you know, sketch of what the show was going to be. Um, and that probably goes back to the fact that they thought they were a shoot like UFC and right. stuff like that. And they well, were taking it, the drift. In that regard, if they thought it was a shoot like UFC, I'd, I'd suppose they could have gotten away with just saying, here's our lineup. Because if you're a shoot, what, what storylines are you, are you providing? You know? True. True. Um, next up, Joey Styles is up in the crow's nest, uh, introducing his guest color commentator, Tommy Dreamer, who was accompanied by Beulah, uh, who was met with a show your tits chant because I'll be damned if Philly doesn't have class uh it's time it's time for part one of the main event here our uh out first big stevie cool and the bwo meanie um what was it like for you walking through the curtain of this match knowing again it's the ecw arena that's no that's that's you know old hat for you but what was it like knowing that those cameras were broadcasting all over the place this is the biggest audience I, I would imagine you to date had ever performed in front of. Um, well, I was, I was fortunate that because I was a part of the invasion angle on raw to help true. promote the pay-per-view. Uh, so I had an inkling of it, which kind of didn't help ease the nerves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it was true. A lot of guys were tense backstage. A lot of people didn't want to fuck up. You know, it's like once they came back through the curtain and they had, accomplished their match they're like ah, they could take a little breath but leading up to that point you know i i'd count them out i was blown up just waiting to go through the curtain but you can tell if you look at that entrance we were just we had rockets shoved way up our ass just waiting to come through that curtain because i'm literally i'm doing my entrance but i'm i'm i mean i'm doing my entrance times a million yeah and, uh, it's it's something that even to the point where like if you watch the uh, opening to or uh, if, when you watch uh, Rise and Fall ECW, they show our entrance and I'm just like Rah! you know just Tasmanian Devil doing my entrance, and there's a point where you see me calm myself, sit down and going, uh, you know I, I kind of catch myself going oh shit you know be the blue guy, idiot. so yeah so you and uh, and Joel both. Um, you were not, when you're coming out on this show, and a lot of times, obviously, meaning you being, you know, a second to whether it was Raven before, whether it's Stevie or whatever, and Joel, you being a, a second to the Dudleys and, and being a part of that package, is there extra stress to you looking at it saying, if I screw something up, this isn't just me, I'm screwing something up. Like, Joel, you screw something up, that's... I mean, this is the Dudley's match. This is their segment with, you know, not, of course, to take anything away of your contributions to it. But if that doesn't go well, now you kind of feel like, oh, man, I just, I set a bad tone for their match. And Meanie, same thing. You, you come out there, if you screw something up, you're not where you're supposed to be in yeah. their match. Is it that much more stress than if it's your own match, if it's your own thing? Uh. What added a little bit extra stress to the matches, we knew that uh, we were short on time. We, we we were dancing that fine line of not having our main event finish on air. Uh, at ringside, I'm standing there at ringside, and I'm I'm cheering and watching Stevie and rooting them on and all that stuff. But meanwhile, uh, around ringside, Todd Gordon runs up to me and goes, we're running out of time. Tell him to take it home. And I'm like looking, <laughs> and I look over at the ta uh, the timekeeper table, and uh, Bob Ortiz's brother, uh, Rocco, uh, standing there. He's got the pencil in his mouth. Like, 
take it home, you know, wiggling the tie, everything you can imagine to try to get the guy's attention. And you could see me, you know, lean in going, guys, take it home, running out of time, you know, and Todd Gordon's we're running out of time. We're running out of time. <laughs> Just uh, running around the ringside that, that, you know, the pressure was kind of off of me not to screw up. Yeah. Uh, and the pressure was to get the, the, the message to the boys. Hey, you know, uh, time's getting tight. We need to, uh, get this, uh, wrap this up and get the main event on, you know, the, uh, get to, uh, you know, Terry Funk. Joe, what about you? Um, be it this show or just in general, that type of pressure, knowing that you were for the most part, you're, you know, I mean, look, you're introducing the Dudleys. So that's your, uh, that's your role there. Was there extra pressure on that for you? Did you ever say like, I don't want to screw this up for them? Uh, not that I recall you ever screwing any of those up um, that I remember with, with the lines that you had always impressed me that you were able to remember all of that. Yeah. Um, like we talked about before, the introduction wasn't so much lengthy. So mm. the memorization wasn't so much, but we were doing a lot of things new this time that we hadn't done before. Like um, our intro was a donut. We were live for the first time going from Devon pitching it to the animation, like the cold open. Mm -hmm. And then that pitching back to me where I'm like, as I was saying before right. I was so rudely interested. So that aspect of it, where I had to take a time cue from somebody that was new. Um, so, so there was a lot new, like Meanie said, in early 97, I think pay-per-view was still running on tape. I don't think it was digital. Regardless, your window was your window. There was no exemption for being live sports. Mm. If you had 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. or actually probably 1058, that's what you had. They would not keep you on the air if you went long because somebody else was renting the next window and they had to start on time sure you would get fined for every second you went over window it was that kind of thing so um so yeah we we didn't want to look unprofessional our first time out where we're trying to run our ending highlight package or even just our copyright and sure. before we can run it, we're getting clipped. So th there was there was a lot that was new to deal with when it came to the aspect of live TV and being on pay-per-view for the first time. Uh, next up, the Sandman enters in classic form, uh, which unfortunately, if you watch it on the uh, WWE Network, it's not it's not what it what it really was. Um, yeah. Smoking, drinking, cutting his own forehead by smashing his beer can on it, uh, and then finally yeah. Terry Funk enters the arena. Uh, Terry Funk defeated Stevie Richards and the Sandman in an elimination match at 19 minutes and 9 seconds. Funk and Sandman pinned Richards at 15 minutes and 41 seconds with a spike powerbomb. Uh, Funk pinned Sandman with a moonsault after Richards super kicked Sandman as he had a trash can over his head. Uh, due to pre-match stipulations, Funk earned an immediate title match against ECW world champion Raven uh, before we get to that match, Meltzer had some uh, opinions on the Sandman's entrance, saying, Sandman broke two beer cans over his head before the match started, so he was already bloody. Actually, it was three. He offered the third beer to Funk, who wouldn't take it, so he guzzled it and slammed it on his own head. I don't know where the gimmick begins and ends with the Sandman, but he seems to live it totally. And he's going to hurt someone seriously if he goes into the ring loaded doing all these dangerous stunts. Uh, all three of us actually have been in the ring with the Sandman. Uh, Meanie, yeah. you, I'd have to imagine, more than any of us. Uh, what do you guys make of Dave's comments? Uh, it's not totally out of, uh, out of bounds, uh, so to speak, because you know, there are... You know, there have been instances where people, you know, refuse to uh, work with a hack in his uh, in his uh, his condition. Most notably, uh, McFoley Cactus Jack. 
had you know complained to Paul about his uh you know his altered state so to speak so for Meltzer to bring that up I mean it's a legit concern but uh for those of us who had been around him that long uh we kind to we kind of grew to accept it and uh in some ways he actually worked a little bit better <laughs> with a buzz on a uh, man sober I've worked with same man drunk and a little bit better drunk yeah I don't know uh but uh yeah I mean uh there's way to Dave's comments about him uh working impaired uh, oh, I, but, I'd have to imagine I mean you know my I of course somebody working impaired is not uh but, rec- uh, to that point he's probably not the first person to work impaired and uh when it comes to Terry Funk, I'm sure Terry Funk's worked his share of people who, yeah, you know, through the '60s and '70s, are like, oh, so and so's got a word on. <laughs> do you, you know? think? Do you think that um, Meltzer was, as he mentioned himself, he could he couldn't really distinguish uh, the real guy from from the gimmick? Do you it's think not that a gimmick? I, well, yes. I mean, anyone who spent any time with him, and I spent the least time of him out of the it's three of us. But, um, yeah. But do you think he bought into the chugging the beers a little too much of just like, like for him, was that going to have him loaded the way it's going to have me on the floor? Uh, oh, that, was, that was probably his 20th beer. That's what, okay. You know, I remember I'm, working a show he'd with walk, him. He'd walk into the locker room with a case of beer. And, That's what uh, I was going to say. I remember working a show with him and he just, man, giant case. I was like, oh, he's brought some for everybody. That's really kind. Nope. That's all him. Um, <laughs> And uh, and it was all gone before he yeah, went to the garden. It wouldn't, be, so. it wouldn't be anything for him to have a couple Long Island ice, iced teas. You know? <laughs> um, Joel, any any uh, experience working with him? That, did you ever have any concern of him being uh, impaired? No. I, the main spot that I worked with him taking his offense was getting caned. Mm-hmm. I got caned by yeah. him a half or a dozen times. And I figured that thing... Um, no, um, I don't know if alcohol is a performance-enhancing drug when it comes to caning or not. He could have probably got me the same way with that stick he wanted to, whether he was sober or whether he was drunk. So no effect on me. Hack's another one, another genius, um, a lot yeah. more misunderstood because a lot fewer people recognize and um, and know of his genius. Super bright guy, unbelievably yeah. intelligent taught me backgammon the only person i've ever played backgammon against in my life was my teacher hack i've since forgotten how to play it but um just a super 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 um just a really thoughtful pensive again be like you'd have to spend an hour with him new jack's another one you'd have to spend an hour or ten of real quality good time with some of these ECW guys to know who the real hack is. So I don't know how much time Meltzer has spent around him, but if you haven't spent actual time around him when he's not in gimmick, then you have no idea of what his gimmick is when he's not in gimmick. And like Meany said before, if he even ever really is in gimmick. And, uh, and uh, to add some to that, uh, for Hack to let his guard down and let you in a little bit, he's got a kind of he's got a feeling out process sort of of sort where, like, he could talk to me and Joel in a, in a different way that he could probably talk with somebody else, and we could talk to him. And likewise, me and him, me and Joel could talk to Hack in a certain way. A few others could probably talk to him, and because uh, we have that connection, we have the respect and we have that experience with each other where if somebody on the outside was around them. They'd be like, Oh, this guy, you know, Oh, I skeeve him or whatever, you know, <laughs> nothing against Dave Meltzer. I, I, I appreciate all of his passion, all of his knowledge, everything he's done for and within the business. And I've been on and off an observer subscriber and the off isn't because I don't like his product. It's just, I've been on and off an observer subscriber since I was 13 or 14 years old in 1989. Having said that, though, just in general, and perhaps more with Hack than the next person, if you treat him like the Sandman instead of Hack or James Fullington, you're going to get the Sandman. If you ask him Sandman things, you're going to get Sandman answers. 
It's kind of like what Meany said. He'll let you in depending on how he feels he should treat you based on how you're treating him and the context and the vibe. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, Meltzer did give the match four stars, um, yet described it as, quote, a stiff and dramatic garbage-style FMW match, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, 34 seconds after the match ended, I timed that myself, 34 seconds after the match ended, the next match began. Uh, Funk pinned Raven to win the ECW title at seven minutes and 20 seconds, uh, heavily bleeding in this match to the point that a doctor came out to stop the match, but Funk begged him not to, uh, which I don't know if that was planned or not. Um, as I mean, obviously Terry Funk, this wasn't the first time he bled. Um, right. Fans chanted for Dreamer to save Funk, uh, but Dreamer reminded all of us at home listening that he had given his word um, and that he would not interfere. Meltzer noted um, that at one point, quote, a whole bunch of Hell's Angels types showed up <laughs> and stacked tables near the broadcast position. Uh, personally, I don't remember Hell's Angels' uh, plaid phase, but regardless, um, it was members of Raven's Nest. Uh, while that was happening, Reggie Bennett hit the ring and powerbomb yeah. Terry Funk. Uh, for those who are not familiar, Reggie is a former wrestler for All Japan Women's Wrestling. Um, do either of you have any uh, good Reggie Bennett stories? Uh, none other than the fact that I met her that night. I was a fan of her work. She's a former, also she's a former powerlifter. Uh, so I was well aware of her work. Uh, she worked in all Japan. She might've worked in LPWA. Uh, yeah. Other than that, I, I met her that night. She was awesome. Uh, quick in and out with the company. She, uh, I think that was her only appearance there, uh, to the, uh, the hell's angels. Uh, one of the, I would give a shout to out to like the bigger of the hell's angels was, a. Uh, <laughs> Pennsylvania independent wrestler named T Rantula who uh, ran shows in uh, Western Pennsylvania out towards Pittsburgh. And uh, he came out and he, they used him. So a little bit when people go uh, watch the cops on raw, they go, Oh, which indie worker is that? So <laughs> as far as uh, Raven's uh, flock, uh, shout out to T uh, T Rantula and uh, shout out to uh, Reggie Bennett there. Uh, it might also be noted because uh during the uh, the, the three way dance match, uh, the uh, Michinoku Pro match, when they threw out the uh, ribbons, mm. uh, they had to store those under the ring. And then when you know Sandman and all them had to pull the barbed wire from underneath, <laughs> the ring, it pulled all the ribbons with them. So it kind of took away from the effect of people using real uh, barbed wire, and it looked like they were just hitting each other with confetti. Confetti. <laughs> You know, so that, that was another little thing, a little thing of, of note that I remember from that. It just, it didn't kill the match, but it, no, it kind of like, oh, it, it and, added some, uh, a different type of color to the match. Some flair. Uh, yeah. Uh, Joel, <laughs> do you have any, any interactions with Reggie Bennett? Any memories? I didn't. I introduced myself to her and same as Meanie. I was familiar with her from uh, being, I knew that she had done some lifting and I knew that she had also worked in Japan and been in the LPWA, uh, had watched that stuff on cable growing up. But um, no, no, I just, uh, she seemed she was nice. awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she seemed really nice. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was just a one-off or whether it was supposed to go somewhere. And, you know, I just don't know. But I, mean, uh, I know but she, she was nice. she was there the night before uh, at the banquet that honored Terry Funk. Um, so I wonder if maybe it was just a, Hey, you're here. Come do something, yeah. come get involved. Why not? You know, you're here. Yeah. Um, so eventually, uh, Raven taunts dreamer, uh, who is blindsided by a returning big Dick Dudley styles mentions he's out of jail, uh, which is where he actually was from my research. Um, Joel, why was he in jail? And what can you tell us about the man behind the big Dick? um he was um he was put in to the dudleyville penal system mm. and uh and the case is sealed all right uh anyway big dick uh he ended up going through the tables uh dreamer 
hit the ring and DDT'd Raven. Funk only got a two count, but the timekeeper rang the bell by accident. Uh, Funk then pinned Raven with an inside cradle for the actual win. Um, Meltzer remarks that under normal circumstances, this would have been so anticlimactic because of the bell ringer screwing up, but things were at such a frenzy at this point that it was okay. The place went nuts with fans hugging Funk as the show went off the air, three and a quarter stars. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm assuming the timekeeper there was hearing the, you know, we're running out of time, we're running out of time, and saw a finish and thought, okay, this is it, good, they're, they're going, you know, they're going home. But uh, in retrospect... <laughs> Like I like I said, not to cut you off, but uh, but to you know, you yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna cut you off. Break your eyes. Um, yeah, leading up to that match, Todd and Rocco, the timekeeper, were like, "Take it home, take it home, take it home." Right. Well, he probably just thought that was to go home and prematurely rang the bell just out of sheer nerves and not wanting to fuck up, as you know we had been talking about. In retrospect, uh, should the triple threat have been earlier in the show? Should a match have been maybe cut even uh, to allow more time for this match? Because it felt so rushed to me, which, you know, it was, by the way, uh, <laughs> because of the hard out uh, of going off the air. What do you guys think? Do you think that there should have been, instead of immediately following, that it should have kind of been, hey, we're in a time this, so we've given ourselves, and this, this is, tw- you know, not ju- you know, 2020 vision. I know this is airing in the start of 2021. Yeah. Uh, but looking back, Obviously, we know what happened, but had this match been earlier in the night, that would have given you that opportunity to say, hey, so-and-so, you're, we're cutting three minutes here. Hey, this match, we're cutting two minutes here. We're cutting a match entirely, if need be, because, hey, this is our main event. Do you think that, in retrospect, that's something that should have happened? Uh, Joel, we'll start with you on that. Uh, I don't know if I'm in a position to second-guess um any of the positioning or any of the structure or order or booking of the show um yeah i'm gonna pass on questioning it um it's very hard to time stuff out perfectly it's very easy to armchair quarterback it like you said um i i, I think it's it would be for me too nitpicky to uh to say what if if we would have moved that Meaning now it makes you seem like a real asshole if you uh, if you critique. Well, it, no, but... I mean uh, everybody's an expert in hindsight. Sure, you know what I'm saying. Uh, and I'm somebody who's been victim of uh, time constraints, where I've been in the gorilla position, ready to go out on Monday Night Raw. And sorry, meaning your segments cut. Somebody went too long. So that's the uh, the cruelty of doing live television. Um, I'm sure they had it timed out perfectly you know, on paper and you know, all that good stuff. But somebody who has run shows and Joel's run shows as well, too. You try to time them out and sometimes it doesn't always go according to plan. I mean, perfectly, uh, you know, you could probably could have said they could have cut a match here or there, uh, like one match. I think uh, and that's the thing. I think looking back on it and again, like I said, this is hindsight, um, you know, looking back, yeah. um, if you were, if, if you were to, book this type of a show again, to me, if I'm booking it, I would have learned from this experience and said, well, we need at least a match buffer in there. You know, something we can cut out just in case everything else goes long. Do you think, guys, that it was the lack of experience, not that, you know, Paul Heyman hadn't been around, but the lack of experience in the live production of the show? Um, Because obviously... You know, ECW shows, they were they were pretty much highlight reels that were thrown together. They weren't live, the TV. So to do this first show like this, um, do you think it was just just a lack of experience with that? Nothing, you know, I mean, this happens all the time. Yeah, I think it was just growing pains, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's not like it was, you know, Paulie's first time on TV. He had been with WCW for years, and sure. he's done plenty of pay-per-views. But again, this is his first time laying it out and stuff like that. So could you cut out a match? Could you cut out a highlight package? Maybe. Uh, I will say I do like the fact that the mat one match bled into the other because to me that added a high, heightened sense of urgency. 
because you know like oh man how you know the doctor just came out and how can terry keep going and terry ends up winning against all these different odds you know whereas if there was a buffer in between that might have given a chance terry a chance to recuperate and all that stuff and, yeah, and i don't i really don't know anybody who elicits as much uh reaction from the fans for showing that he's in pain than terry funk yeah. i mean god that guy just watching this back i'm looking yeah. at go, it's it's masterful you you just i mean it, it definitely helped the fact that he was it, it's the in the age, eye yeah but the age that he was too because there's kind of that part of you who i mean we didn't all realize that he would still be doing these things you know 40 years after this but you know we we you look at him you're just like wow back then he seemed old you know nowadays it's a little different but back then he seemed oh you're like oh my god this poor old man you know we know who he was but dear lord you got to stop this thing and it was just so beautifully done um yeah. i do want to note that uh the as the story goes and joel you mentioned this earlier as you know um the, these tales have been told but the story is that 24 seconds after the show went off the air the generator blew um so even if there wasn't a hard out uh, that generator was going to make it one, if that's true. Yeah. What do you guys, um, what do you the remember? Yeah, what do you remember from that? Um, how much truth is there to that whole thing, the generator blue and all that? Uh, you want to go first? Um, uh, just to get it out of the way, because it's really just a reiteration of what I said before. Um, I've heard it. You know, I've heard that story. Uh, not just in The Observer, but I've heard it, you know, closer to home. I've heard it more in inside parlance i've just heard it spoken about that uh that it is quite possible that all power was lost the generator blew and that if we wouldn't have gotten off the air we would have gotten off the air anyway because we made it by the skin of our teeth that's all i know and uh i i, I remember it happening because uh paul Heyman went out we, we were off the air the pay-per-view has su successfully ended and paul Heyman went out to do a post show speech to the crowd and there was no microphone because there was no power so were Paul the lights Hayman, out the lights weren't out it was just the you know when buildings have those electric like mm -hmm. there's a power outage and you have those reserve lights okay. that run on battery or whatever it was kind of it was just that you know and paul went out to give this post-match speech and just like as i'm talking to you Everybody, and the, the beautiful thing of it is the crowd just was silent. They just shut up and they listened, kind of like a Jake the Snake Roberts promo. He talked silent. So you get close to the TV and listen. Paul, whose voice was shot from uh, you know, talking for two hours and screaming and all this stuff, and he gave a, a, a heartfelt, thankful thank you to the crowd, those in, 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 in person. And, you know, the only people who know about that speech are the people who witness it live because the cameras couldn't record it. And again, we're all experts in hindsight. I had my, the biggest surprise is Rob Feinstein didn't run out there with his, uh, seven 11 camcorder and record it for Paul for uh ECW fan cam and, you know, give the footage to Paul for TV. But yeah, the pat, the generator blew, uh, all the, you know, the power went out. <clears throat> and uh once that pay-per-view ended my main memory is watching uh joey styles just stand in the middle in a in the middle of a locker room full of other performers and just break down and and weep openly just weeped like he just stood there just like put his hands out like that and just took off his glasses and just you know start rubbing his eyes and start crying and guys went over and we all put our arms around him and you know, he did it because, you know, the, 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 the pay-per-view didn't want it. They, they, the production company didn't want him working by himself. And Paul fought for him and said, hey, he's our guy. He's going to do the play-by-play. -play. You know, with the exception of Tommy coming out, you know, for the main event, he called he called the play, a nationally syndicated pay-per-view by himself. And that, that, was, that was the main memory of the show after all was said and done was the emotion of Joey Styles breaking down in tears in the locker room. We kind of answered my my uh, my next question, which was going to be, um, what what's your main memory from this? Uh, but Joel, yeah. you know, what do you 
remember the response being um, and backstage that night and even the weeks to come, you know, what was, uh, what was that feeling to be a part of something like this? And do you have any memories, much like what Meanie just shared, any memories backstage uh, after the show? Just a, a, was it a feeling of relief, feeling of success, both? It was just that first pay-per-view, man, that took a year or two to happen. And finally, now it's over. And just kind of being able to bask in the glow of accomplishment. And I'm selling my nose. And I'm just thankful to have been a part of it physically and everything else. Just the atmosphere. You've got people from WCW visiting because they're in yeah. town for Nitro on Monday. Just the importance where there's like bomb sniffing dogs in the yep. building the day of the show being on a block and in a building that isn't wired to do live television and yeah. putting a live television truck out there and doing it anyway i i, I don't know man there, it was um it was really surreal it, it really was up until that point for sure it was absolutely the highlight of my career and maybe the highlight of my life you know uh for fans like myself, I was really lucky to find out that Beyond the Mat was there. And Beyond um, the Mat, I was thinking that I dropped so, that. I was yeah. thinking that as well. So I, I, I'm, I'm curious for you guys. What, uh, what are your memories of of Beyond the Mat being there, and then to be? Um, I can picture me. I can picture you being seen backstage and Beyond the Mat. Joel, did you make it uh, to the final cut? Not so much not featured. I don't think so. They talked with me for two or three minutes, a match or two after I had been out there taking total elimination. I mm -hmm. might have had an ice pack or something on my nose. And I think they were compelled a bit by the fact that I wasn't actually a wrestler. I was a manager, but that I was physically involved and that even the managers get hurt. Right. So we talked for two or three minutes about that kind of thing. I think really when Paul is giving the speech before the show, you can see maybe the back of my head. I'm the first person or one of the first people maybe at the end of the speech that kind of claps. So you can see maybe some of that stuff, but I'm certainly not featured in the film, unfortunately. But uh, anybody who hasn't seen it should check it out. It's, it's amazing. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Well, like, yeah, like Joel said, I remember when Paul gave the uh, this is the dance speech. Joel was like, there were, me, actually, me and Joel were like two of the first shown clapping and i think there was a moment uh you were you were you were in there when they, they were showing the uh the behind the stage the boys being around the monitor watching uh you know terry's match or something like that but uh yeah it, it was pretty cool it's pretty cool knowing they were there and and filming well it was an amazing uh it's an amazing event um if you were a fan like myself uh right outside of Philadelphia, growing up, just wanting ECW to be respected for what I loved it for. Um, there was just, you know, I can only imagine if, if I felt vindicated as a fan, how the two of you must have felt uh, and the rest of the locker room must have felt at the end of that night. Um, this has been so much fun for me. This has been a highlight of my career to be able to just sit with the two of you and talk about this. Uh, had you told me when this happened uh, decades ago at this point um, that I'd one day have that opportunity to sit with you and ask these questions, um, man, I, I, uh, I, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, but I'm not the only one who asks questions. I do, of course, have the opportunity to ask questions that came to us from the great people over there at Ad Free Shows. Um, they asked if anybody had questions for us, and I'm going to go through those if you guys uh, are up for it. Sure. Uh, and I apologize in advance to everyone whose name I'm about to butcher. Adam, Sy how would you say S-I-U-D-Y? Siudi. There we are. Adam Siudi. Uh, what were the feelings backstage that the pay-per-view was finally taking place after all of the problems leading up to it? It was just a... Uh... It was, it was, it was like almost like a fever dream, <laughs> you know, all the times of, uh, being promised that we're going to do pay-per-view and it was off and it was on and then, okay, we're going to do it. But like, uh, I was taught when I was 
training with Al Snow, everything's written in pencil because there's an eraser on the end of it. So you took, you, you try not to take anything for granted leading up to it. Uh, even league going to the building the day of anything could have changed. Sure. You know, uh, anything, you know, it was the carrot, you know, any, any moment somebody could take, could have took that carrot away. So, uh, went into it. Uh, I don't even remember what we did that night after the pay-per-view It's just all, I remember the show and then up to, you know, everything. I don't remember anything after we left the building. It was just, it's funny. You, it's funny. You mention that because Frankie D had a question. How insane was the after show party? Um, but you don't even it remember. Been, it must've been good. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> Joel, any memories? Same here. Same here. I mean, it, except for the usual, I couldn't tell you what I did that night. Um, I wish. Uh, Michael McClanahan uh, asks, what was the most challenging part of bringing Badly Legal to pay-per-view? What was the atmosphere like backstage, and can you compare it to the atmosphere backstage at a WWE or WCW pay-per-view? So a couple of questions there. Uh, what was the most challenging part of getting Just, uh, it Getting I'm sorry? someone to cover it. I'm assuming getting someone to to air it. I would say is the most challenging part. Yeah, yeah that I think we pretty much answered that. You know, yeah. uh, people to trust us to, that we're going to put on a quality product. And like you said, like Joel said earlier, people thought we were like the UFC. Mm. You know, they thought they were going to witness a live execution. You know, so and then, you know it didn't also also didn't help that like uh, not the, I'm not getting political, but one of the main proponents of Ultimate Fighter was senator john mccain and this was you know this was on like the cover of newsweek and all the major papers and stuff like that and we were lumped in with that right so this hot hot topic issue uh didn't help us at all you would think they say all publicity is good publicity but in this case it really hurt us tommy hansman jr writes uh why wasn't there another barely legal pay-per-view which i thought was an interesting question because ECW had its recurring November to remember guilty as charged. Um, why not Joel? Do you have any opinion on that? Um, I think it's good that the first one didn't get repeated. I think psychologically there's something that does make it stand out that it wasn't like living dangerously or wrestle Palooza, or of course, November to remember that there was only one, the first one, which is also the only one ever at the right. ECW arena. Uh, I think also to give respect to what Barely Legal connotes, and it's not just a play off of a dirty magazine that contains <laughs> the images of women between the ages of 18 and 21, but what it connotes is that we barely were able to get on pay-per-view and mainstream television because thanks to mass transit, the confusion with EFC, us being on Inside Edition, all of that stuff, we were, at that time, barely legal. Adam Pritchard, with a T, uh, <laughs> would love to hear some recollections of Paul Heyman's speech to the locker room before the event. Now, we talked about that being featured um, beyond the mat. Um, any any recollections from either of you, Meany? We'll start with you, of, uh, of actually hearing it live. Because, you know, when you see something edited for a documentary, I mean, it, it was moving as all hell on that. Yeah. Uh, what was it like live? Uh, Paul was pretty good at motivating the locker room. And, um, you know, I mean, we've had our share of locker room speeches pre and post show, you know, and meetings and all that good stuff. But uh, with everything that it took to get to that point, and the fact is, you know, up at that point, even though we were there, there was a lighting rig and camera and production, still nothing was guaranteed. Um, like I said, in wrestling, everything's written in pencil because it's got an eraser on it. Sure. So uh, the fact that he, you know, he, you know, he went up the steps, called everybody over, and you're watching it, and it's just, you're just watching it like, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and like, you after that speech, you, I, I could have went and ran through a brick wall. Uh, but it, it was pertinent to emphasize just how, I mean, had the importance of the, the moment wasn't lost on any of us. Uh, but it was good to hear from 
Paul verbalize everything we had been feeling up to that point. Uh, because, you know, like I said, nothing was guaranteed and, uh, we were all fortunate, you know, the, you know, to be on the, f there's only one time to be on something for the first time. Sure. And this is our first time, first pay-per-view. And hopefully we were, this was the hopes of it being something leading to something even, even bigger. So, uh, yeah, it just it, watching in that moment, it was just, you know, mesmerizing because it, 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 it meant everything in any, it meant everything to w what we had gone through up until that point. Joel, your, uh, your feelings, are they, do they echo meanie? Yeah, man. Um, listen, I was an only child growing up and, uh, and my parents worked a lot and I was raised a lot by either a housekeeper sitting in for them or TV. Um, I no siblings. Um, I wasn't much of an athlete, no little league baseball. I didn't play college football. Somebody like me is, is the, is one of the people who was touched a lot by that speech because it, it gave that feeling of something greater than yourself. It, um, man, I don't know. I, it's like in major league, you know, where, where skipper's like every time we win a game, because there was just something <laughs> that we needed to go out there and accomplish. Um, if Louis Spicoli and balls Mahoney was to test out the cameras and to warm up the crowd, that's what Paul's speech did for us times a thousand. Mm -hmm. We were already ready to run through that brick wall, like Meany said, and bust through the curtain and do our intros and be us. But after hearing Paul give that speech, you weren't just doing it for yourself. You were doing it for ECW and everybody in the locker room, and it was absolutely poignant. It, it, it was really – anybody who didn't feel stirred or teary or heart-wrenched um, it, it is just not a very emotional person by nature because it really was a soul-stirring moment to know that what we'd been working for every weekend, two and three shows a weekend – all of the sacrifice we had made in the prior year or two, all of the injuries anyone had gotten in the prior year or two, it was all leading up to this. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, Meany, you had said that it was, uh, you can only have the first one time, and that's what we had here today. Uh, this is airing, as we're told, January 1st, 2021. I can't think of a better way to kick off the new year. This has been my absolute pleasure uh, to bring this to all of you uh, at adfreeshows.com. Um, I would like to thank on behalf of the Blue Meanie and Joel Gertner, adfreeshows.com, for allowing us to be part of their amazing family. Uh, make sure to follow us on social media at That Was Extreme individually as well they are at blue meanie bwo and at stud muffin says i'm pretty sure you can figure out which one's which and i'm at so says sure enough do not forget to check out our podcast joel's is the 69 minute eargasm and of course you can find myself and the meanie every monday on mind of the meanie for joel gertner and the blue meanie i'm josh Chernoff. happy new year everyone we will see you again real soon and remember more moments from a time that was extreme.